and we're live. Asalaamu As Alaikum, uh, 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 brothers and sisters. Today we got a special interview. The brother uh, Muhammad Abdul Khaider, I, I guess, is the name. Um, Asalaamu As Alaikum, brother. How's it going? Wa Alaikum Salaam. Wonderful yourself. Doing good, man. Doing good. This is a long time in the works. I know we've, we've been talking for like a while, you know, uh, and I don't even remember the exact details. I'm so, you know, busy with all the stuff that I got going on. But uh, hey, you know what? There's a guy. Let's see uh, who's here uh, uh, really quick. L let's just see who, uh, uh, who this guy is and see what he wants. Uh, hey, brother. Are you there, brother? All right. So. So I tried. We'll come back to him. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. So are you? Walaikum salam, Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Hey, uh, uh, let me do this interview, and then, you know, if you could, you could come back, like, towards the end, I'll add you at the end. Yeah, definitely. I'm here. All right. Okay, so here we go, brother. We're just going to jump right into it. Sorry for that. Uh, so did I say your name right? It's Abdul Qadir. Abdul Qadir. Okay, is that Q A D I R or K H A D E R? Well, it's supposed to be with the Q, but my dad wrote it with the K H on my birth certificate, so that's the way. So you're stuck with it. <laughs> He's like, I'm stuck with it. All right, all right. You could actually go and get that changed if if, if you need be. Well, but um, so okay, uh, uh, no worries. Um, and, and you have a YouTube channel. Uh, check, uh, uh, check out his YouTube channel. It's named Muhammad Al Qadr, I think. Uh, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so uh, where are you from, bro? So I'm, I'm born in Toronto, and my family is from India, Pakistan. Okay, so you were born in Toronto probably 1985. We're, we're talking the 80s. Yeah, yeah, 89 actually. 89 okay so so that was after that 1984 ordinance 20 passed uh were your parents part of the asylum were they asylum seekers is that how they got to canada no my maternal grandfather was the first person to came to come to canada he came in the 60s before all this stuff happened the political stuff got and it okay i'm sorry yeah yeah the basic that's 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 the first of my uh antecedents who arrived here and then gradually the rest of the extended family he's he sponsored them right so they came here okay so he got a work visa is that the story i believe so but he became a citizen pretty early on and he was a superintendent of schools actually he was a pretty uh, educated individual and very successful and he was one of the really early um Ahmadis in canada his name one was of the pioneers of the canadian jamaat yeah yes. yeah, yeah. He lived in Sudbury, and uh, he was his name is Bashir Ahmad Shad. You know, ex oh, wow, exactly like good. your name, except no Shah. It's Shad with the D at the end. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, we're, we're not Sayyid. We're not Sayyid, but, but the same name as you almost, yeah. Okay, uh, often imitated, never duplicated. But, you know, <laughs> we'll just leave that be. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny because, like, some of these guys have called me the promised Bashir because of my blog, but I don't ascribe to, to any of that. And um, all the guys who are showing up in, in the chat, just wait hour and a half. I got to do this interview. Uh, yep. What up? What up? But let me finish up and then I'll add everyone at the end. So, okay. Uh, so, so, so you're born in 1989 in the, in what Jamaat was it? Uh, in the Toronto Jamaat, you could say. Okay. Cause I was, I, I was born in Toronto. Yeah. Okay. So in 1989, what was the Toronto Jamaat looking like? Were there any places of worship? How many Murabis? How, um, how many um, Amadis? And do, um, do you mind if I call them Kadianis? Yeah, of course, to your discretion. So at that time, the Beit al-Islam Mosque was being, uh, I believe it was already constructed in, uh, in, in, in Maple, which is a little bit north of Toronto. And we used to go there for the Friday prayers. And at the time, Mirza Tahir Ahmed was the Khalifa, and I remember I, I remember I was a kid, and I used to go to the Jalsa when he would when he would come visit Canada, and so I also met him personally when I was a kid, and I distinctly remember he gave me one of those uh, Arrow chocolate bars, but not the snack size that we have now, like the the, the actual large uh, size. Oh, so, 
<laughs> There's a video of Mirza Masur Ahmed in Africa handing out uh, a chocolates to the kids and, um, you know, uh, uh, interesting. So, okay. W was that the only Ahmadiyya place of worship in, in the, was that the first one? I believe so. That, well, they, they had the mission house there for, since the eighties, which is yeah. just a house that they converted into a, into a, like a markas into a center. Yeah. They and always they, start, always start with the mission house always. Right. Right. And then they built Beit al-Islam, very beautiful mosque. And uh, until very recently, I believe it was the largest mosque in North America. Beit al-Islam. Hold on. Let me pull that up. Uh, um, hold on just a sec. So uh, uh, Beit al-Islam in, let's see where this was, uh, Canada. Beit al-Islam mosque in Canada. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's 10610 Jane Street, Maple, Ontario, Canada. And it's huge. And it's huge. So is is was this your local Jamath? Uh, no, because uh, when I, uh, after shortly after I was born, I we went back to Sudbury and um, we but we would come to Beit al-Islam usually for Friday prayer and definitely for the Jalsa. They used to have the Jalsa Salana there until the people started getting um, multiplying and so they had to uh, start renting halls and stuff like that. But they used to pitch the tents in the Beit al-Islam behind it. But now that they've all developed it into a housing um, colony. But before that, it was all like, you know, farmland. It was all, uh, you know, open. And they used to pitch tents. It was very nice, you know. It was a very nice experience. My childhood experience, you know, so I remember it very distinctly. But, of course, yeah. things have changed, right, you know, so... So, so what city did you live in? Uh, Initially, I lived in Sudbury. It's like five hours north of Toronto. Sudbury. And, but wait, yeah. five hours north? Yeah. Bro, it must be hella cold up there. If you're five hours yeah. north of Toronto, man. Yeah, it's pretty cold there. Oh, oh and I see it. it. It's just north of Lake Huron. Okay, and are, are there a lot of Amdis up there? Or when, when you were growing up, were there a lot of Amdis there? There was one uh, Syrian family who were Ahmadis. Uh, I believe the gentleman is still alive. His name is Hasni. He must be really, really old right now. He might have passed away. He, I don't know. But he's really famous in the Toronto Ahmadi community. He comes every Friday. He comes there from Sudbury. And he, he also gives the azan for them as well. Um, as, uh, at least the times when I was there, I remember. Yeah, so. uh, uh, really quick. The... Uh... The Beit al-Islam, isn't that where the Jamia is at today? No, no, the Jamia is in Mississauga. So the Jamia it's, near, is it's near another mosque called Beit al-Hamd, if I'm not mistaken. Beit al-Hamd, okay. And that's where Ruzi is currently in his fifth year out of seven of Jamia, probably. Uh, okay. So so in, in, in Sudbury, is there a masjid now? I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't been to Sudbury for years. But I know the Ahmadi community there is growing, so there's a couple of people there. So they might have a center or something. So what local Jamaat were you assigned to, to give Jannah to? Well, um, me, are you talking about me personally? Because I, I, I basically drifted away from the Jamaat in my teenage years. So I don't ever remember giving Jannah, to be honest with you. Good job. Good yeah. job. <laughs> but no, no. So what, 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 what Jamaat were you assigned to? You and your parents? Uh, well, I was basically with my dad. So my, my dad was, uh, uh, my dad moved to Scarborough after Sudbury. And uh, I was basically part of the Scarborough Jamaat. The Scarborough people might still remember me. Yeah. Scarborough. Okay, hold on. Let me pull that up. Just so we can be sure, because, you know, a lot of people are, are, are trying to uh, discredit you. And it's like, bro, what are you guys talking about? This guy was a, 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 a Kadiani M. Oh, so Scarborough is a suburb of Toronto. Yeah, it's in the east of Toronto. So so you moved to Scarborough yeah. uh, at, at what age? Uh, you could say uh, I was in my, I was in my, you know, like preteens when I moved in there. Okay, so yeah, yeah. so you're at uh, okay, so in 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 Sudbury, I hope I'm saying that right. Hold on, I'm, I'm gonna say it right. Hold on, because I just saw it in Sudbury. All right, <laughs> so uh, uh, who are some of the Murabis that, that you saw around Sudbury? There were no Murabis in Sudbury. Uh, the main yeah. Murabi I know, who was actually missionary in charge uh, in Toronto, like for the entire Canada Jamaat, actually is uh, 
Molana Nassim Mahdi, who I think is now in America. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought he retired or something like that. I don't know. I, I, I haven't kept up with him, but he, he, I remember praying behind him and I remember listening to his uh, Darus e Quran and stuff like that. So he was like the first Murabi I kind of looked up to. Really? Okay, so in Scarborough, who are the Murabis in Scarborough? Because Nassim Mahdi was in charge back then of the whole Canada, so he wouldn't be leading the Salat at a local masjid. You know, I don't know who the Marabi was in Scarborough. There might not even have been one at that time when I was there. Because I don't remember anyone who was a Murabi, but it was just handled by the office bearers. You know, they would do the, the prayer. Oh, there probably wasn't even a Mur Murabi, in, even in Scarborough. So, you know, ja Jamia was started in Canada in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, or okay. Yeah, so at, that was even before 2004. Like, the Murabis would have all have been from India, Pakistan. So the, lo the local Canadian Murabis they didn't start coming until they started graduating, like in the in 2011, because it takes seven yeah. years. So, but exactly. so in, when you were growing up, there were maybe five or six Qadiani Murabis all through Canada, uh, yeah. and you know uh, some are assigned. I mean, e even in America, there's like ten. You know, I've counted ten, maybe twelve. You know, uh, in the entire country, which you know the amount of Murabis will tell you how many Amdis there are in any country. Would you agree? I guess so. I mean, uh, I, I'm not an expert in that, but that's, I know there, there's a couple of Murabis I know by name in Canada, like the older Murabis, like you got Mukhtar Chima, you got Hadi Ali Chaudhary. I don't know if he's a Murabi, but he's, a, he's yeah, I think he's a Murabi. Okay. You got uh, Ansar Reza. I'm not sure if you would consider him a Murabi, but he teaches at the Jamia, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that's all he does. I, I don't think he actually leads a prayer or anything like that. Or right. I mean, maybe he does. So, yeah. Yeah. So all right. So so you're growing up in in Canada, in your so now it's 2000. You're about 11, 12 years old in 2000, 2001, 2002. Yeah. Uh, what what do you think about the hundreds of millions of of con people who converted to Ahmadiyya in the mirrors? Yeah, that was around the time they were talking about this 200 million figure, and uh, I I never believed that. I I mean, I just thought it was just you know, they're just exaggerating big time. But so I didn't know 12 years old. You were like, oh, this is hogwash. <laughs> well, why are these guys lying? Yeah, but I, you know, I, I didn't pay too much attention to that, uh, to that idea. But I just thought, you know, in the back of my mind, I don't think there's 200 million of us. But uh, apparently that's the, that was, I do remember distinctly they were putting out that figure and they were talking about it a lot. We got 200 million. So then I think oh, they, they uh, downsized it to 40 million after or something like that. But no, what? they didn't downsize anything. They just they just stopped talking about it, <laughs> you know, and that's how they sort of sort of ended that. But uh, so, OK, I believed it. I'm like 10 years older than you. I believed it. I, I was telling them I was in the U.S. Air Force. I was telling my friends, bro, we're taking over the world, bro. What what are, you, what are you guys talking about? Pretty soon, everyone's going to be AMD. It's all true. Everything I've ever been taught is true. It's happening, you know? And then I, I think like 05, 06, we all realized it was a lie. And these guys just lied about everything. So, okay. Why did you drift away from, from Qadiani Islam or Qadiani version of Ahmadiyya? Okay. So there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of the main reasons was uh, I was kind of religious when I was younger. Like I was like visibly uh, like to dress in uh, shalwar kameez and put on a topi and stuff like that. And I was just starting to get my facial hair. I was becoming a teenager, so I wouldn't shave it off. And so one day, some of these, uh, you know, are in Canada. We have our version of the CIA is called CSIS, and the version of FBI are called RCMP. You know, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. These guys approached me one day and uh, they said, you know, we just want to have a chat with you, completely voluntary. We went to some cafe and they said, you know what, um, there's this growing problem of extremism in the Muslim community. At that time, you know, it was it was pretty big. 9-11 had just happened. Uh, how old were yeah. you? Uh, when 9-11 happened, I, I was uh, like, about 12, 12, 13 years old. No, but I mean, when did the cops say they wanted to interview you? Oh, yeah, that, that was when I was around 16. Okay, so it's like 2004, the Halifa's yeah. dead. There's a new Khalifa. Okay, yes. got it. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely after the the new Khalifa was elected. So they approached me and they said, um, 
you, you know, why don't you do some volunteer work for us, basically, the to summarize. And I said, sure, you know, I'm, I was really excited, actually. I was like, yeah, I mean, I want to get involved in this. And uh, they kind of encouraged me to start going to Sunni mosques. You know, they'll say, you know, there's a mosque over there. You know, maybe you want to go there and see what's going on over there. You get some so intel. I, pardon me? They asked you to go get intel against Muslims. Yeah, did, it, did they know you were a Qadiyani enemy? Uh, I don't know if they knew that for sure or not. I mean, because uh, they approached me. They must have known something about me. Where were you when they approached you? At was, this, is, this, was in Scar this was in Scarborough. Or this was somewhere in Toronto. Uh, where um, I met um, how many Qadianis were there in Scarborough in 2004? At the meetings, uh, they would show up a couple of dozen on the men's side. There was women's side as well, but uh, we were on the men's side. So kids would come as well. So let's say m maybe about 100 or so. Who would okay. show up to the meetings regularly? And yeah. uh, um, how many Kadiani Amnis do you estimate that there are in Toronto in 2021? I have no clue. <laughs> okay. The, la right. the last jals the last Jalsa I went to, there were was probably back in 2005 or 2006 or something, and there were probably 15,000 to 20,000. But then you got to put in the guests and the people that are coming from out of Canada as well. So around that many people in total. So maybe about 15,000 in Canada at that time. Yeah, and normally half of them are guests. In fact, at, at the Kadian Jalsa, almost 80% of the, the people are guests. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so where was, so... Um, oh, so, so they approached you randomly out of nowhere and like, yo, can you do some intel for us? Yeah, basically, and, and, I, and I volunteered and they said it's completely voluntary. We just want to learn more about Islam, and you seem to have some knowledge. And and they kind of direct me to certain mosques. I started going to the mosque, the Sunni mosque, right? And yeah. I, I kind of got impressed with with the Bligi Jamaat and and some of the Salafi mosques, and so kind of drifted away from Ahmadiyya from the Ahmadiyya group. Uh, but I always had a, a respect for Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, and always considered him to be, if not a prophet, a great uh, saint and a great reformer of the of the Muslims like even now you still believe that now yeah i definitely believe that and i believe he's a and i have his books and i and i read them regularly and i have an appreciation for some of the one thing i'll say about him for sure may not agree or not but this person he really loved the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i mean that that I, that I get from his writings like he he was fanatically devoted to the prophet so that's something which i can't i can't that's something which i i, I no matter how much people tell me some bad stuff about him, that's something I can't get out of my mind and heart. That this guy, he really did love the prophet, and there's no doubt about it. That is hilarious yeah, that yeah, that you seem to 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 believe that. But uh, no worries, brother. You're entitled to your own opinion. Uh, you know, I'm not here to tell you what what to believe or what not to believe. You're you can believe in whatever you want to believe, bro. Doesn't bother me at all. Doesn't uh, stir me up or nothing. So, yeah. So we're gonna get to that. Um, so okay. Uh, so you're you're growing up. The cops randomly pick you out out of nowhere. We don't even know why. The cops, like, the uh, intelligence agencies, CSIS and RC. Yeah, RCMP are the cops basically, but they're the feds. The feds are coming to you, bro. Go get us intel on Muslims. You're they know you're a Qadiani. They're, you're like, okay, sure, why not? This is what I mean. This is what MGA did too, right? Uh, have you read about uh, MGA's life in Sialkot? A little. I, I know he was uh, working there, or he was studying there as well. So. Do you know they found a, a spy from Saudi Arabia, and MGA uh, acted as an, an Arabic interpreter? No, I never heard that. Interrogator. Yep, he 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 did. Since Sirat al Madi, have you read Sirat al Madi? I have seen it on media. I haven't really read most. Uh, like I've probably read maybe one or two accounts, but I haven't really re actually read more than one or two accounts. But no, I haven't read it, the book fully. Okay, was MGA's father and brother religious? Did he come from a religious family? No, definitely not. They were not religious. Was there a mosque in Kadian when MGA was growing up? I believe his father built a mosque like when he was about to die. That's 1876. MGA would have would have been 35, 40 years old. Okay. So in MGA's youth, did he ever go to Juma? I don't know. 
where could he have went? There's no mosque in, in Qadian. Right. There's no Muslims. Well, well you, you know that uh, Il Qadian is a village. And then, by the way, in the Hanafi school of thought, Juma can't be held in a village. Like it has to be held in a city with a certain level of population. So, uh, I mean, after the, after the Mubarak Mosque Masjid was constructed, I believe that's when they started this uh, Juma thing. But before that, they were really strict on the Hanafi mother. And the Hanafi mother doesn't even uh, uh, consider Juma valid in a village. You know, it has right. to be. A, it has to be a city, right? Yes, yeah. Right, and so, so I haven't seen that ruling. And was that by the Mughal Empire or the Ottoman Empire or what empire used that ruling? Well, it's from that's from the Hanafi mother. Like you'll find it in the classical books. But uh, yeah, the Mughals uh, implemented the Hanafi mother, right? And especially in the time of uh, Aurangzeb and his Fatawa Alamgiri, he was he was the one under him. It was compiled, and that ruling is in that book as well. Yeah. Got it. So did Mirza Ghulam Mahmud walk to Batala on Juma to attend Juma? I don't know, but I, I do know he he must have gone to Batala a couple of times to when he was studying under his uh, uh, under his teachers, you know, in his youth, because he was studying with Muhammad Hussein, who his, was a uh, colleague. So did yeah. Mirza Ghulam Mahmud ever go to any masjid in a city? Outside of Qadian for Juma, ever in his life up till his claims, uh, I would assume he might have gone in Batala maybe once or twice or something. There's like that. nothing, brother. I'm gonna tell you, they will not admit that he ever went to any masjid, even when he was in Sialco. Remember, remember, he was in Sialco four years, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't go to Juma. Is Sialco a silly city or a village? He never went to. He, he, so what, what what you're saying is uh, it's not mentioned, or it's actually it's mentioned that he never went to Juma and Sialkot. It's not mentioned. Could, it's, so if something's not mentioned, it could be like it did happen, but they just didn't mention it because it's just no, 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 no. Here's the reason they don't mention it. They don't want to admit that he prayed behind other people. Okay. Right. You see, and but but but, but 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 you assume then that he did pray behind other people, right? When he was in Seattle court and stuff, right? I mean, no, he never obviously. left. He never went to congregational prayers at any masjid in his life until he made his claims, and then he prayed behind Mulvi Abdul Karim Seattle Korti or Nuruddin. Other than that, he never prayed behind other people. Right. So just to give you, like you said, he's a lover. I I just wanted to mention that. Because so I've spent 17 years researching who Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is from authentic sources. And I'm telling you, it's not there. He came from an irreligious family. He doesn't love the prophet. You, you, you can forget that. You're entitled to your opinion, and we'll, and, and we'll get to that. But I just wanted, wanted to be clear. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed didn't go to congregation. Not even in, okay, did he ever go pray congregational prayers in Qadian in a village? No record. He didn't even go to someone's house. There isn't even other Muslims. Like maybe there was a few other Muslims in the city. Did he pray at his dad's house, his cousin's house? It, it, it was all one complex. Did they have congregational prayers? There's no record. There's nothing on it. Right? So anyhow, sorry to have sidetracked you. So, um, so okay. Next question. Are you an Amity today in 2021? So it depends what you mean by Ahmadi, right? I mean, it's a term that I like. I like the word Ahmadi, like just from a linguistic point of view of, of somebody who follows Ahmad. And I believe um, that even Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, when he came up with this term Ahmadiyya, what he uh, had in mind. I'm sorry. Um, I hope you know he stole it from Sir Sayed. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I know Sir Sayed used the term before. Like he, he named his, his books Tafsir Ahmadi and stuff like that. Right, but it, but it was because it, he was attributing it to himself, right? Because uh, his name is Ahmad, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. But as I understand it, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, when he used the term Ahmadiyya, like for example in Barahina Ahmadiyya, he was uh, referring to the Prophet and not even to himself, because the Prophet is also the Prophet's name is Ahmad, right? Okay, so we'll get it. So so okay, later on, his son claimed that Ismahu Ahmad was about Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Eventually, so I'm going to come to that, how Mirza Ghulam Ahmed made his claims and how he set them up. Because maybe you don't know, you haven't studied the material as much as I had. have, it's okay. 
So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. So are you a follower of Mirza Ghulam? Um, so, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a blind follower of him because I don't regard him as a prophet in the formal sense that you have to just blindly follow him because if he is, then you, that's it. But I, I, I respect him. I read his, his books his, and I profit from his literature and I consider him a very saintly and pious Muslim reformer. And uh, I consider him uh, to be the Mujaddid of the 14th century. And so I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a follower of him in the same way that I'm a follower of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I definitely, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of him. Let's put it that way. Okay, I like are you, yeah. okay, are you a Lahori Amli? No, I'm not a, I'm not a Lahori, no. What problem do you have with the Lahori Amli? Well, first of all, the the Lahore, like um, the Lahori group, um, it it sort of fizzled out, as you know. Like it's it's non it's virtually non-existent. So I mean, even if you wanted to be a Lahori, how how could you? They don't they don't have anything. They don't have any any. They're not operating pretty much. Like maybe in in some like uh, backwater area, maybe in some island in the Caribbean, they have a mosque or something. But they're not really uh, they're not really functional. Like they're a defunct group, you could say. That's that's the main thing. And secondly, they have some strange beliefs. They believe um, uh, they don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. They believe he his, Joseph the carpenter was his biological father. That's one of the main differences I believe between them and the other group. So I don't I don't accept that. I think that's that's a heresy. So obviously I have a problem with their beliefs as well. Got it. Uh, do you know that they had that they have a center in Toronto? No, I didn't know that. No. Are Are you currently living in, in in Toronto? No, currently I'm in Vancouver Island. Oh, you're on the West Coast. I'm on the West Coast. Yeah. O okay, got it. I'm gonna quickly just post the data for everyone to see. The uh, Lahore Amis uh, are technically in Ontario. I, I don't see a place of worship for them. I just posted it in in the chat. Let me give you the address. Tell me if it rings a bell. It's 175 Tor York Drive, Suite 54, North York, Ontario. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, North York. I know I know in the North York area, but that, that particular street, I don't know. It's probably a really small center in some obscure area. Oh, well, I just looked at it. seems like it's somebody's house. And um, they, they do that in California, too. They, uh, they, they operate out of a mission house. Um, but you know the uh, uh, Kadiani Jamaat in India has only has that they have less than ten um, places of worship in India, and mostly it's mission houses, which are you know people's homes, what they're calling a mission house that you know people come and pray and and uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So so okay, uh, the Lahori Amis are there. They're off the uh, freeway four hundred, off the four hundred and the four hundred seven, off that off that interchange. For feel free to check them out. It looks like they're close to the some of the Kadiani centers, um, but so okay. Are you a rogue Amli? I mean, you could put it that way. I mean, I told you how, how I how I left the Jamaat basically, and I told you that I have some differences with them as well. So, you see, I would I would consider myself a a, a Muslim like in in the Sunni tradition more than an Ahmadi because. Although I respect Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, I do, although I, I have a lot of love for him, and I think he's a, he's a reformer, but I'm also I'm, I, I I associate more with Sunnis. Like you know, I'm coming on your guys' streams. I'm not going on on Razi's streams because we got more in common, I believe, as 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 mainstream Muslims. I go to Sunni mosques to pray. I go to for their Friday prayers. I I even dress like a Sunni Muslim, as you can see my my my. Uh, my style is 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 not an Ahmadi style, like the typical Ahmadi style. I mean, so as so obviously, you know, I feel more comfortable in in this side, but I do respect Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, and I think I think Sunni Muslims have a a negative perception of him, which I'm trying to you know uh, trying to give them a different picture, a different side of the story. Yeah. So so and we'll we'll come to your revelations and see if you're still in Sunni Islam in in probably at like the end here, but. So, 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 okay. Uh, and, and, and for the record, uh, I have a comment 
that uh, the Ahmadiyya uh, building is just 10, 10 minutes away. It's located on Islington and Fit and Finch. Yeah, I used to live in that. Like my, my dad lives in that building right now. It's called the Boat of Peace. So yeah. uh, there are Lahori Amnis in that area. You just don't That's hear nice. from them. You, 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 they don't make a lot of noise. You, you see what I'm saying? Um, so, okay. And uh, uh, um, have you ever met a Lahori Amni? No, I've never met in person, never. Okay. Um, have you ha And you've been to Pakistan. Did, did you go to Amelia Buildings on Brandreth Road in, in, in Lahore where MGA died? No, I've I only been to Lahore once, and that was for a wedding. I was only there for a day or two. Bro, you only so went to Lahore. Hold on. You were in Pakistan, you only went to Lahore once? Lahore is, bro, the food alone. Yeah, and I only went for I only went for a wedding. Like I was only in somebody's house. Like we drove to their house. We slept over there for the wedding. We went to some hall for a wedding. Came back to their house. Might have eaten something. Then went back to Multan. <laughs> so I didn't see any of Lahore. Okay, got it. And and really quick, uh, uh, what do uh, if if a Muslim claims to get revelations, does he remain a Muslim? Like prophetic level. Like if someone says I get revelations, like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed got revelations, not like the saints, not like. But if you mention like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, how do Muslims treat that? Well, if you want my personal opinion, obviously you're asking me. So I believe if somebody claims to get revelation, that in itself is not uh, kufr or heresy or misguidance or going outside Islam. However, he could be lying. Like he could be lying that I'm getting revelation and I'm not, and he's not getting revelation, in which case he's not a believer in the sight of God. But that's not our business, right? Like we have to judge by the apparent. So if he's getting revelation, either we would say, okay, we'll have Husna Dhan, we give you the benefit of the doubt, we believe in your revelation, or you don't have to believe. You could say, I don't, I don't believe in your revelation. You know, you know your your revelation, keep it to yourself. I have, I, I don't need it. However, if, he's, if he claims to be getting revelation and the content of that revelation is clearly contrary to Islam, to the Sharia, to the Holy Quran, to the Prophet's Sunnah, then I wouldn't consider that revelation. I would say this person is, uh, is being, if he's getting revelation, it's not from God, it's from the devil. Okay, so if you were living in the Mughal Empire, and and you claim to get revelations the way Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is getting revelations, what would they have done to you? I don't know. I'm not I'm not a historian. I know some of the kings were pretty fanatical, like Aurangzeb. I know some of the most of them were pretty relaxed and didn't didn't care what people were doing. Did anyone yeah. claim to have revelations like MGA was claiming in the Mughal Empire? I don't believe so, but I, I know some of them, like Shah Waliullah and uh, Mujaddid al Fathani, they also claim to receive inspiration, ilham, and they were pretty much respected by the, like, especially the Mujaddid al Fathani, Ahmad Sirhindi, Rahmatullah. But, but did, did, did those guys claim it the way Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was claiming it? Because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was claiming it in a different way, it's not the same. I mean, when you say different, I, I think I think um, from what I know, the the only difference is frequency. Like he well, was claiming Mr. to get a lot more frequent. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Mr. Ghulam Ahmed said he was the only one to be called a prophet in the whole Ummah. Fact, right? That's what he said. Shah yeah. Waliola never said that. These other guys never said that. Yeah, that that's probably true. And uh, Mr. Ghulam Ahmed called himself the Hatim of the are, are, are you familiar with, with, with that situation? Yeah, I'm familiar with that term. So did did Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, when he was saying that, was he essentially claiming to be the last prophet? No, because the Khatam al Khulafa is, is actually a, a term which is well known among the Sufis even before Mirza Ghulam Ahmed came along. And they actually reserved that term from the Imam Mahdi. And even they don't interpret it in, in, the, in, in a chronological sense. Like they don't say Imam Mahdi is the last saint. And there's no saint after him. They interpret it uh, in a in the way that Ahmadis interpret Khatam and Nabiyin. So I would say if Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was uh, referring to himself as Khatam al Khulafa, what he meant is that he is uh, like he's like the standard for the saints of this Ummah. 
Not that he's chronologically the last of the saints. Ruzzi, but Mirza Ghulam Mahmud said he's the Hatim al like Isa al Islam was the Hatim al of the Mosaic dispensation. And he said, I'm the Hatim al of the Muhammadi dispensation, Astaghfirullah. Right? Yes or no? Isn't this the example he gave to understand it? Yeah, I'll take your word for it. I mean, I'm not surprised if you would say that. Well, I can give you the reference, brother. Like, so you haven't read any of this? You're, I mean, I know, I know, I know. He said Jesus was the, was the 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 Khatamul Khulafa of Bani Israel, which I agree with, by the way. Yes, he was. So in that in that vein, in that context, was Isa the last Khulafa of the Mosaic dispensation or the best? He can't be best, right? Because Musa, Al-Islam, Ibrahim, Al-Islam, he's not the best. Well, when we say when we say Khulafa, we're, we're talking about Khulafa of Musa. So obviously, like like when we're when 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 somebody says I'm Khatim al Khulafa in this Ummah, they're not claiming to be better than the Prophet, they're claiming to be the best of the Prophet's successors. So Jesus, if he called Jesus Khatim al Khulafa, what he's saying is Jesus was the supreme successor. Of the mosaic dispensation not that he was superior to moses himself because moses is the one being succeeded to by these khulafa okay but, but mirza glam Ahmed didn't write that you, you, you see what i'm saying mirza glam Ahmed simply said it the way i'm saying it mm -hmm. the way I'm, I'm telling you he said it he didn't say it doesn't include musa alas long see what i mean and, and well, said, that's that's implied when you when you say khulafa right when you say khulafa in israel right you're talking about prophets that succeeded Moses because that's the Sharia of, of their time is the, is the Mosaic uh, dispensation. So it's it's prophets that beginning with uh, Joshua and then up until Jesus, you have all these successive prophets of Moses. So they so what Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is saying is that out of all of these successive prophets, Jesus is the Khatam. He is the seal of them. Okay, so he's the best. W wouldn't Isa also be the last? Yeah, it, it would have a dual meaning in, in Jesus' case. So if in, in the case of Isa, Islam, he's the best and the last, and Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is saying, oh, me too. And in fact, as we know, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claimed to be better than Isa. So Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is essentially claiming to be better than all the prophets after Musa, in your opinion, how you're in, interpreting it, and better than all the saints. He's better than everyone, right? And, and, except a few. So now he's top five. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is claiming to be the top five that Allah sent on this planet. Okay, th this is a very technical question. What, those, first of all, let me clarify my belief. I believe that a non-prophet can never be better than a prophet. And I believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is not really a prophet not in the formal terminological sense. So I don't believe Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was better than Jesus, let alone any other even minor prophet that came before in Israel. He's not better than them. I know initially Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said that I'm superior to Jesus in a partial sense, which I accept. And then you, in our discussion, you showed me the references where he started in Hakikat al-Wahi, where he's claiming full superiority. So that's the place where I would disagree with Mirza Ghulam. I would say, you know, what you ha what you were saying before was right about partial juzwi fazila, but when you start talking about kulli fazila, you know, absolute superiority, then uh, either that could be interpreted where he's not talking about his his uh, his own self, but him in the capacity of the prophets uh, uh, being the prophets bruise, or it was something which I just don't uh, agree with Mirza Ghulam because as I said, I'm not his blind follower. There are some things which I don't agree with him on. So how could you respect Mirza Ghulam Ahmed when he claims as a non-profit, in your opinion, to be better than 123,995 prophets? He's claiming to be better than them. Is so, that the worst yeah. blasphemy? I, I understand. See, see, the thing is, while I explain to you my belief, this issue for me, it's not a fundamental uh, article of Islam. The question of superiority is not for is not actually a fundamental part of Islam. Like it's not one of the articles of faith. So if people people have had disagreements on this issue, there are Muslims out there who believe non-prophets are better than prophets. There are Muslims out there who even say the angels 
are better than the prophet. Like they would say Angel Gabriel is superior to the Prophet Muhammad. There are Muslims like the Mu'tazila who believe that. There are Muslims like the Shia who believe their Imams are better than all of the prophets except Prophet Muhammad. And now there are even Shias, which I can uh, give you their videos, who are saying that Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu is equal to the Prophet in every sense. There's actually a Shia, like you'll see on my channel, I put up a clip of a Shia who was saying Ali is equal to the Prophet. So my point is, I explain to you my personal belief, a non-Prophet can never be, it's the same as a Sunni belief, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmed might have differed from that belief, but even if he did differ from that belief, it's not a fundamental part of Islam that if you differ from that, then you're like, you're not a Muslim. I don't agree with that. So, so okay, uh, uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed took it even a step further. He claimed to be the second coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Astaghfirullah, Nauzubillah. Did he or did he not? Yeah, but, but not in the sense that you're giving the impression, like, you know, reincarnation or Muhammad, he's lit, no. He's, he's talking about being, uh, having lost himself in the Prophet's persona, so that in, in a figurative sense, he calls himself the Prophet Muhammad. Like he's a reflection of him. That's, that's he, the concept, you know. Right. Uh, have you read uh, Hutba Ilhamiya? I have. Uh, I've not obviously not read it in Arabic, you know, um, but I've read it, the translation of it, yeah. Didn't he uh, he say that Muhammad um, has appeared in in uh, in Greater Shan again in the second appearance? Uh, I don't I don't know if that quote is from Khutbatul Ilhamiya. I know I know one of his uh, disciples recited a poem, which is to the effect of that Muhammad Pir Uttaraya Hamme se orage se barkar apne shan me. So what that what what he's talking about is that. The Prophet appears again and again and again among the saints of the Ummah. And so Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is just another one of those saints in which the Prophet is reappearing. But this time he's appearing in a superior uh, form than the previous saints. He's not claiming that he's superior to the Prophet himself. That's how I understand it. And I actually went to Rabwa to get this question because I had the same question. Uh, when, I, when, I read this, when I read this couplet, I said, well, I need to, I need to clar get a clarification. I went to Rabwa in 2016, or pardon me, November of 2015. And I met a Murabi there, a big time Murabi. He's, he's well known in Rabwa. His name is Suleiman. And he hosted me in his house. And I asked this question specifically to him, and this is the answer he gave me. Got it. Um, so obviously, we totally disagree. We see you as softening the trend. So also in that same book, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed called himself the, uh, the last brick. The Akhri eat. And so here's the thing. When Mirza says all these things, he doesn't give an explanation. See how you're trying to explain on his behalf and other people are explaining on his behalf. He didn't. He just left it. So I'll give you an example. In 1884, he, he claims to have gotten a revelation that Fatima, astaghfirullah, nauzubillah, put Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's head on her thigh, right? Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with with the vision well, like that. But hold on, but so hold on. Twenty years later, he says I'm the Mahdi, and look, they, I got information on it twenty years ago. I didn't explain it. I didn't. I, I I didn't even know what it meant. But that the revelation from twenty years ago meant that I I I'm part of the Alibath, and I that's why I'm the Mahdi. See what I mean? There's a lot of slickness. Same thing with, with the claim of being uh, Isa al Islam. He, he, he slipped it in. Okay. Um, have you read um, Brahini Ahmadiyya 1 through 4? No, obviously, I have not read all of his books. I have his books. Like, uh, I have physically have the Ruhani Khazain uh, collection. And I've read pieces of it, but I haven't read it systematically. No, I haven't. Okay. So, um, Brahini Ahmadiyya was supposed to be 300 arguments, not 50 volumes. Do you agree? Yeah, it was supposed to be 300 arguments, right? Yeah. Not 50 volumes. Did MGA ever say it was 50 volumes? Well, he said in, in volume 5 that he was supposed to make it 15 volumes. But that was after he died, right? When was volume 5 published? Well, published uh, it means, you know, it was published after, but he wrote it. Obviously, he wrote it. He was the, the one, he's the one who wrote it. So dead people okay, don't write books, right? <laughs> when was it published? I don't know when it was published, but obviously he's the one who wrote it, right? Like dead people don't write books, right? Okay. 
are are you do you know how music works after people die music comes out that they wrote years ago that it's edited now okay so anyhow back to brahini amelia volume five have you read it no i haven't read it no you know they smashed six books together mm-hmm. and, and gave us brahini amelia volume five so anyhow so let's go back brahini amelia was supposed to be 300 arguments right how many did he make in one through four I guess you know better. Just one argument. Well, I'm gonna take your word for it, but you know, I'm, I'll check. I'll check these things out. You know, I, what do you think the argument was? Because I, I have I have read a bit of Barahini Ahmadiyya, and I'm pretty sure there's more than one argument. There's a lot of these metaphysical and and ph- philosophical arguments against uh, Hinduism and against but Christianity. In, so, so in, in sorry to cut you off. In Sita al Badi, they say. He was supposed to write 300 arguments. He only gave one, and it's incomplete. He stopped, and it was incomplete. The argument was Islam is superior to all other religions because he's like, my God's been talking to me. And that's why Islam is superior. So it's important to understand this. But then he denied his prophethood for 20 years. Eventually, obviously, you don't believe this. Lahoriyamis don't believe this. The Qadianis do. In 1901, he claimed prophethood. So, okay. Um, next question. Is, is, is the Qadiani Jamaat upon Kufr? No, definitely, definitely not. Definitely but not. Th- they claim Mirza is a prophet, and you don't even believe that. Well, you see, the difference is they, they like that term prophet. Like, they like to use that term. Even though I have, I have a reference from, from Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, where he actually advises the Jamaat, you know, don't use this term, Nabi, too much about me, because it's kind of spread confusion. But they obviously they like to use the term and they like but as I understand it, if you look at the substance of the belief, it's perfectly okay. Like it's not kufr or anything. Because they're saying he's an Ummati prophet. They're saying he's 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 a, he's not a prophet in his own right. He's a prophet in who's subordinate to the Prophet Muhammad. And he's a prophet in the link because you know, prophet linguistically, it just means somebody who gets revelation, who gets news of the unseen. Yeah, hold on. So hold, that's hold, 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 hold on just a sec. So to be clear, in 1915, the second Halifa wrote Qol al-Fasl and Hakikat al nubuwat Have you read those books? No, but I, he- I heard of Hakikat al nubuwat yeah. Okay, in those books, he's, he's giving the Qadiani position. Whether you accept it or not, he's saying they believe Mirza to be a prophet. And he even said thousands of prophets can come. Okay, so whether you b- agree with it or not, whether they're wrong or not, this is what they believe, right? Are you willing to acknowledge that they believe Mirza to be not just a Nabi, but Rasul, and better than all the prophets after Moses, the same as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he claims equal, okay, the Qadiyah and Jamal says, ah, not ex- metaphorically equal only. Okay, whatever. That's what, what you're saying. We know better. So this is what they believe it is okay. So let me rephrase it factually. Do the Qadiani Amdis believe MGA to be a prophet and messenger? Yes or no? Yeah, I would say yes. They believe he is a prophet. Okay, whether they're right or wrong. Okay, based on that, is it kufr? No, it's not. It's not kufr. So you're saying a Muslim can believe that in other prophets after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and even after Mirza Muhammad. So I, I wouldn't agree with that belief, um, technically speaking, but I wouldn't call that belief kufr. Certainly, my principle, by the way, is that if some, as long as a person professes the, the testimony of faith, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, I consider them a Muslim full stop, and I, w- I would never make takfir of them as an individual. As for the belief itself, I don't even consider the belief to be kufr because they, they have uh, clarified that what they mean by that is that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is not a prophet in his own right, and he is subordinate to the Sharia. So he's not bringing a new Sharia. He's not bringing a new religion. He's not like Baha'u'llah. He's not like some of those other false prophets that came before, like Musaylama, etc., who started their own you know, laws and religion. So because based on that, I would not consider the belief to be kufr, even though I don't agree with it necessarily. Got it. Uh, what does the Hanafi fix say about anyone who claims prophethood after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? 
Well, there there is a statement attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa where he says that uh, even if you ask a prophecy claimant for proof, that itself is kufr. Although the Hanafis explain that to me, if, if you ask with the intention that if he actually gives you the proof, you're going to believe in him. There's a, there's a rhetorical way of asking, and then there's a sincere way of asking, right? But the, a, num a, a number of things. First of all, I didn't find any um, sanad for this saying of Imam Abu Hanifa. Number two, if it is true, uh, he's talking about a prophecy claimant that is a prophecy claimant that says, I'm bringing my own sharia and the prophet in his own right. He's not talking about an ummati nabi type of claimant. Number three, the Hanafi fiqh is not even about beliefs. It's about it's about practice and laws. So even if it is like a, what something that Imam Abu Hanifa believed, not necessary for us to accept it because he's our Imam in fiqh. He's not an, our Imam in aqidah. So okay, uh, 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 moving on to the next question. What's the difference between your revelations, your ilham, and your Zaglam Ahmed's ilham? Is it the same thing? It's just called something different. So my ilham are inferior uh, because number one, they're the inferior in quality. They're not as pronounced. They're they're not as definite. That's one difference. They're not as frequent. They're kind of ordinary. They're expressed usually in dreams and visions, which is quite uh, which I believe should be an ordinary phenomenon among Muslims. I don't know why people have made me controversial by claiming to get ham because I believe that ilham should be something ordinary, maybe not you know universal among Muslims, but should be an ordinary phenomenon based on my understanding of Islam. So that's that's the basic difference. Okay. Um, do you believe in the second coming of uh, Isa al-Islam bin Maryam? Physical. The physical second coming of Isa al-Islam, Isa bin Maryam. No, not, not physical. Okay, so you believe someone will come in his space, in his spot, uh, and you believe that's still, and, and MGA is not the Messiah? Is that what you believe? So uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, MGA as you call him, he himself said that uh, it's possible that Messiah will come in the future who is more, uh, you could say, more literally fulfills the ahadith about the Messiah, such as coming in Damascus and by the, the white minaret and uh, all the other things mentioned in the hadith. So he said it's a possibility. I go a step further and say it's that's what I believe. There will come a Messiah in the future. The difference is that I don't think he'll come in Damascus, though I think he's going to come in Jerusalem. And I wrote an article on that on my website. Uh, so I do believe that a Messiah will come in the future who will more literally fulfill the hadith. But it's not going to be that actual Jesus of Nazareth because I believe he passed away. So, okay, you basically believe the exact same thing as Mirza Glam. Okay, is Mirza Glam Ahmed the Messiah? Isa bin Mariam. I, I bin would him. say he is a Messiah, not the oh. Messiah. He is a Messiah. Yeah. So you believe he's one of the messiahs. Okay, is Mirza Ghulam Ahmed the Mahdi? Again, he is a Mahdi. He's not he's, the Mahdi. Okay, like when so, we say, yeah, yeah. So you don't believe Mirza Ghulam Ahmed to be a Kafir, Dajjal? You don't believe any of that? You no, believe, I don't believe he's that. one of the messiahs, one of the Mahdi's? Okay, so are you a rogue Ahmadi? Well, that that's a term that you're using. So, I mean, I guess uh, I don't know what you say to that. But as I said, I, in, in, I think you already asked the question, but... I, I identify more with, with Sunni Islam than with the with the Ahmadiyya Jamaat. Well, but I'm well, just me, a Sunni who respects well, Islam. You, and sorry to interrupt, these beliefs take you out, brother. Just to tell you straight up and down, uh, you're probably welcome to come pray in any must, Sunni masjid. No one's ever going to say anything to you. Even Ahmadis are, you know, welcome to come. Even Christians. And even, even anyone could come pray. No one's going to ask them anything. Well, I, I like your attitude, but I have been kicked out of mosques. <laughs> for okay. when people sort of discovered my beliefs. Right. Well, 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 but for the most part, you could go show up to any mosque and no one's going to, if if you're a rando, you know what a rando is, a random, just showing up, no one's yeah, even going to well, ask you. Know, well, even if a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu, then they, they won't even care either, right? They say, okay, no one's even going to know. No one asks. You know, this isn't the Kadiani Jamaat. If there's someone different, everyone knows and they'll go, hey, who are you? Why are you here? And obviously... You worked for the Canadian uh, FBI, CIA, and went to get intel 
on Muslims. So uh, I find that disturbing. You know, when, when when I was in the Air Force, they asked me to translate. And I was like, hell no. Get the, you guys are lucky I'm fixing the airplanes, honestly. <laughs> I'm not going to translate. I'm not going to help. Well, you know, I, I did that. For, I did that for security. You know, like for to keep peace and the and security in the country. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, because there is there is extremism in the Muslim community. There are young people who, at that time especially, who could be doing some wrong things. So, if if I did, you know, get into contact with them or come across them, and I find out that they're doing some kind of a fishy business, then I feel it's my civic duty to report that to the authorities. Got it. So okay. Um... So 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 why are you not a Lahori Amdi again? Please explain that to me. Somehow I'm not understanding why you aren't a Lahori Amdi. Well, because um, the Lahoris, uh, they don't like their. I mentioned their belief about about the virgin birth, right? I mean, totally. I think that's a that's a very bad belief of theirs. Uh, I've seen the Lahoris as well. Some some of their videos. I've never come across them in person. And they just seem very, 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 very liberal for one thing. Like, they totally embrace this kind of 21st century uh, modernism. Like, you go to their mosque, for example, and they're they're all clean-shaven. They're all wearing pants, uh, suit and tie, or, or jeans and shirt or whatever, and praying like that. They're, they're, there's probably, like, not even people praying in them. Like, there's maybe two or three people praying in the mosque. So they're, they're not a dynamic movement. You know, they're, they totally became liberalized. They totally became modernized. And uh, I think I don't think they reflect the, the spirit of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's teachings either. Like you know, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was pretty conservative, if, as far as I know. He was he was not like that. Well, no, well, no. He walked around with women around Qadian. He got massages by women in Qadian. Uh, in his house, Nuruddin lived with him. Um, that's not a family member. He, you know, when when you live in the house with other people. Nuruddin lived with him. Muhammad Ali lived with him. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq lived with him. Stial Koti um, lived with him. Other people lived. They were all through his house. So he was not about the Purda at all. In fact, he, his wife, there's a famous story of her at the train station not doing Purda and Mirza telling them, everyone to back off. And it seems like once they came to, to Pakistan in Rabwa, the conservatism happened for the Qadiani Jamaat. So, okay. It seems like you only have two issues with the Lahori Amnis. That's modernism and the birth of Isa. Uh, did I understand that um, correctly? Uh, third, third issue is that I think they're non-existent. Like, they're not really, they're not really active. You know, they so only have. Small... They mostly are uh, internet presence. That's it. Okay, so they I might have a center here and there. That's it. Have you spoke to Zahid Aziz on the Lahori blog? And <clears throat> no, I've I've never I've never I interacted with them personally. Okay, I've I've been talking to them for years. Haven't spoke to him in a while, but okay. So, what about Sir Sayyid Ahmed Han? What's your opinion on Sir Sayyid Ahmed Han? And I'm going to briefly give you my opinion. Uh, the British government told him, "We need you. We need you to start this college and train Muslims up to believe that Isa al Islam is never coming back." Um, okay, and then fact: Sir Sayyid Ahmed Han was the first Muslim in the history of the world to deny that Isa al Islam is coming back. No one, no one ever denied that, right? Um, and he also denied the concept of the Mahdi, Jihad. Everything Mirza Ghulam Muhammad stole from him, in my opinion. I, I gave some facts. What's your opinion on Sir Sayyid Ahmed Han? <coughs> so the, the first thing I want to comment on is that you said the British uh, were the ones who kind of gave him this idea that Jesus is not coming back. I kind of find that... I, let me, let me clarify. And sorry to start to interrupt. I've interrupted you so many times. I'm so sorry. But uh, no, go ahead. No what I mean is British colonialism, this is my opinion based on research. Um, the British wanted Muslims to lay down and not fight back. After 1857, the mutiny, they got worried. They said, we need to get rid of this Mahdi, Isa, Jihad, not happening. Shut up, lay down. Take it like the Native Americans took it. And how do we do it? They got Sir Sayyid Ahmed Han. Other people followed in suit. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so specifically about Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, I want to say that I personally have a very positive uh, view of the British colonialism, not just in India, but around uh, Africa and Asia. I think they did a lot of uh, development of the third world, and they kind of civilized us. So we have to be grateful for their for their contribution in that in that sense. 
Sir Said Ahmed uh, Khan, I I have to interrupt you. W would you say the same to the Native Americans and say, no, you guys should be happy the Europeans had metal? You know, you know the Native Americans didn't have metal. So how are they going to fight guys with swords and, and rifles? So would you say the same to the Native Americans? Look, you know, um, the Native Americans, uh, a lot of bad was done to them. I acknowledge that. Atrocities, maybe genocide. But if, if I was a Native American leader at that time, I would have told my people, why, why, why should we fight the, these people? Like, we should, uh, we should accept them as our government, and we should profit from them because they have better technology. They have better way of life. They have, they're more civilized, you know, so we can learn a lot from them. I wouldn't and, say they're more civilized. They had uh, uh, Europeans made better weapons. Yeah, That's they, it. They, had, they had better uh, trade, like, you know, they, they had the, uh, they had better technology, everything, you know, so. No, weapons. Remember, there's no sugar in Europe. There's yeah, no well, well, we're, we're talking about British, the British era colonial. Like, I'm not talking about the Spanish. I'm not talking about the French and those guys that came before, right? But they did a lot. Well, I, I make a distinction. I, I have a positive view of the British and uh, colonialism. What? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's an. So, so, okay. I think the British need to pay a thousand trillion, which would be the next, we would be the next thing. Let's say 999 trillion in, in debt to all the countries they invaded. Anyhow. So anyhow, that'll go down a different road. We're already at like an hour. So let's go back to the question. How do you feel about Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan? And he so, also oh, briefly, briefly, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. I disagree with his theology. I disagree with his modernism. I disagree with his promotion of cultural westernization. But I love the guy's politics. I love the guy's um, political activity and message, you could say. Yeah. OK. So all right, let, let's move on here. Um, why were you in jail in Pakistan? And give us the dates, and, and who were you in jail with? So I, I was arrested in uh, November 2019, and the reason I was arrested was because I had a debate with a Sunni mufti in uh, Rawalpindi. I was working in Rawalpindi at the time as, as a supervisor for a call center for a Canadian taxi company over here, which I used to work for before. And I had a debate with this mufti. It's on my, web, it's on my YouTube channel as well. It's about a four-hour long debate in which we debated about the question of Nabuva. Is it has it ceased completely or is it still kind of uh, open? We had this, this academic debate. He, he, uh, the, 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 the masjid people, they live streamed that debate on Facebook. A lot of people saw it, it went viral. The police got a hold of it. Somebody complained to the police that this guy is preaching Qadianism, which is, uh, which is illegal in Pakistan. There's a law called 298-C which says if a Qadiani is posing as a Muslim or preaching Islam or something like that, then he's liable to three-year imprisonment plus fine. So but, they but you were like, I'm not a Qadiani. In fact, go ask the Qadiani Jamaat. Well, 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 not. Explain, you know, because when they arrested me and, and, and throughout my imprisonment, I never even had a chance to open my mouth and to even, they just like, right. you know, you're just going to jail, you know, right. put the handcuffs on. They so put the arrest on. Hold yeah. that thought. Uh, did you have an ID card in Pakistan? Yes, I did. When you filed, when you filled out the ID card, didn't you say Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is a non-Muslim? No. What happened was uh, here in Canada, I when I was registering for the ID card, I went to an agent who represents the Nadra. It's called the agency. And he just took basic information from me, and he filled it out himself, all the questions. And he just he, he and I vaguely remember him just asking me, "Yeah, you're a Muslim," so he wrote down Muslim. Like he just assumed I was a Muslim, and I consider myself a Muslim too. So, but he never asked me a single question about Mirza Ghulam Mehmed or Qadiani or Ahmadiyya. I don't remember him asking a single. Now there might have been such a question on the form, and he might have answered on my behalf, but I never personally answered anything about that in the form. Okay, but that's a legal document. If, if and, I, and, I, and, I, and as I understand it, that's only for the passport, by the way. No, because, it's for the ID uh, card too. Well, because I had the ID card, and I can and I can assure you, the ID card does not say anything about religion. It just says oh, your name, date of birth. The application. Maybe, maybe, but but as I said, I I didn't fill out the application personally. It was this agent who filled it out on my behalf. Okay, so they even looked at your ID card. He says he's a Muslim, uh, but they're like, no. He's not okay. So you get thrown in jail. 
Uh, and then what happens? Uh, uh, who's also there? So there are a couple of really, uh, you could say, uh, controversial and uh, popular figures in jail. Because uh, this was Adiala jail, right? The Rawal Pindi Central Jail. It's the most famous jail in Pakistan, by the way. And in that jail, you have Dr. Nasser Sultani. He's he's claiming to be the Mujaddid. He's an uh, he's he's ex he's he's from the Ahmadi background. He's a Murabi. He left the Jamaat. He started claiming he's a Mujaddid. You have a guy named Alama Ayaz Nizami, whose real name is Abdul Wahid, and I had a chance to spend time with him. He's this really famous uh, uh, ex-Muslim atheist blogger, and you have a, 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 a guy named uh, Zafar Bhatti. Look him up in Google, Zafar Bhatti. He's a Christian they pastor. Threw you in, they threw you in with all of them guys. They said, all of those guys, yeah. So, oh, I have some some really stories to tell you about that, but if we don't have time, but it, it, was, a, it was an experience, so I'll tell you that much. Oh, man. So, okay. So you, you're like, did you tell people you're next? You didn't even have a chance to explain yourself. So how'd you get out of there? So basically, uh, my family here, here in Canada, they, they were they were going crazy. And they contacted this really big lawyer in Pakistan. Like, I don't know how much money they must have given him. But he's like a, a high court. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. So you're an ex Qadiani, but your family still got love for you. Yeah, my, my, my mother's side of the family is not Ahmadi. Like, they left the Ahmadi. They, they consider themselves fully Sunni. Oh, they have what? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, my mother's when side of the family. Did, 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 when did that happen? Well, uh, I don't know if I told you, but my parents are divorced. They divorced yeah. when I was around uh, one or two years old. And my mother got remarried again, but she married into a Sunni family. And mm -hmm. all of my other khalas or my maternal aunts, they also got married into with Sunni gentlemen. Alhamdulillah. So, so they all like my like my nana, my the first the person who Bashir Ahmad you know, whose name is similar to yours, he was actually expelled from the Jamaat because they said, Why are you marrying your daughter to a Sunni? So they, they expelled him from the Jamaat. Now, before he passed away, my dad told me that Bashir Ahmad my nana, he uh, he wrote a letter of apology to the Jamaat and they might, he might have, you know, I don't know, reconciled with them. But he's buried in a Sunni cemetery in Toronto. So basically, the mother's side of the family, they're all Sunni. And my dad is an Ahmadi. He's part of the Jamaat. He's still a part of the Jamaat. Okay, are any of your siblings still a part of the Ahmadi Jamaat? Uh, no, they're, they're, they're either very non-religious or they're, they're all non-religious, actually. They're, they don't practice Islam at all, uh, unfortunately. They just what secularized. Per yeah. What percentage of the Toronto Jamaat young Amdis born in Canada have left? I have no clue. <laughs> but I would assume quite a few of the more. You see, what happens in the Jamaat is the more educated you are, like you become a doctor, an engineer, or something, and your life kind of goes in a different direction. You don't have time for these Jamaat meetings and being so involved. So some of the more independent-minded people, they just they just leave the Jamaat. Like they're like. Uh, this is pull, pulling me back. It's not like they become Sunni Muslims either. Like they just become totally into their career and they totally become non-religious. And as a result, they have nothing to do to do with the Jamaat. Okay, so they're not like me. I'm Alhamdulillah fully. I believe uh, Isa al Islam has not died yet. I, be I believe in the miracles of Isa. I believe the Mahdi is going to come. I believe that the Mahdi and Isa are separate. Um, do you believe that the Mahdi and Isa are, are separate or the same same people? Same well, I, b I believe that uh, uh, there is a specific Mah Messiah and a specific Mahdi who are going to come and they are separate, yes. But the okay. Messiah can be described as a Mahdi linguistic. Mahdi just means a guided person. So there's even a hadith which says that, uh, which describes Isa bin Maryam as Imam and Mahdian, like he's an Imam and he's a Mahdi, and uh, and and so he he's also a Mahdi. I mean that that's that's not something to be so caught up with, in my opinion. So where are you living now, brother? Are you are you in Canada or in the USA? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm on I'm on the west coast of Canada in British Columbia. Okay, okay. Yeah. Are you surrounded Saint by your family? Course. Is your fam still cool with you? Was what's the story? Well, to be honest with you, my family, you know. They, they did a lot for me. Like, they got me out of jail, as I told you. They hired that lawyer. He got me bail from the high court. And then the next day, they put me on a plane, and I'm here in Canada. But so, my, my, yeah. so you got bail and jumped the country. You're like, I'm out, bro. I got bail. 
yeah, I mean, you see, the, the police even took my passport when they arrested me. And so the the Canadian embassy or the high commission, they found, they found out about me. They came to visit me in jail a couple of times. As soon as I got out of jail, they gave me an emergency travel document. They gave me a ticket. Like the government gave me a ticket, emergency, you know, um, document and everything. They put me on a, at that time, the, the coronavirus was, uh, was just coming out. They had an emergency flight for all Canadian citizens in Pakistan to evacuate them. They put me on that flight. It was jam-packed flight. This would be, we went straight to Toronto. And, um, and bro, the, the, bro, yeah. sorry for me saying, it sounds like your family paid a bribe to get you out. And when, once you got out, you, you, you got on a flight and you're out of there. No, they didn't pay a bribe. They paid a lawyer. Like they paid like a, a really professional, big same, time lawyer. Same thing. Same. <laughs> the same thing, man. C -c 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 the, the, lawyer, the lawyer gave his arguments in the in the court for my bail application. The the it judge. Doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You got to go pay the judge too, bro. You can make the most ridiculous arguments. If they're gonna allow it, they're gonna allow it. You see what I mean? It doesn't matter what you say. You know, if the judge is paid off, you know, the same thing happens in America and Canada. Well, you know, there, there might have been some backdoor kind of pressure on the on the Pakistani government from from our embassy, from the Canadian embassy, because they, they don't want it. Because, you know, if I was still in jail, this would have become an international incident. It would have been like Asia Bibi. It would have been, you know, it would have been here on in the Canadian news. It would have been on CNN and everything that this uh, Canadian citizen has been arrested for blasphemy in Pakistan. The Pakistani government, they didn't want that publicity. So they just say, you know, just get rid of this guy. Just no, tell him never bro. to come back to no, Pakistan. Bro. Uh, Nasser Sultani's family don't have a million dollars to fork up, or even a hundred thousand, right? Your family might have put up thirty thousand to gave you the lawyer. He pulled some strings, got you out. We know how it works, you know. In in America, if you're black, you ain't getting out of jail, bro. You not you you can't even bribe the judge, you know. If if you're a cop and you kill the black man in America. The judge is on your side. They might even call you guilty and give you a month. You see what I mean? There's a lot of there's a lot going on. So so okay, let's sort of move on to the next question. Um, what do you feel about the Qadiani Khalifa, Mirza Masuram? Well, what's your opinion on Mirza Masuram? So uh, Mirza Masrur Ahmed, uh, he's obviously he's not as charismatic as Mirza Tahir Ahmed, his predecessor, and. I think a lot of Qadianis might be disappointed that, you know, he was elected the Khalifa. He doesn't have the char the charisma. He doesn't have the knowledge. But I do think he's a personally a pious person. He's he's a quiet uh, kind of, he doesn't want to stir the boat, doesn't want to rock the boat kind of figure, unlike his predecessor. And he just kind of being, he's like a bureaucratic leader, you know, just kind of just pushing up the Jamaat, you know, just doing the daily work and just giving his sermons and whatnot. So he's not an inspiring. I, I agree, he's not an inspiring leader. But does he okay. get revelations? Does, does, he get, does Mirza Masur Ahmed get revelations like you? I don't believe so. He hasn't published any, right? Right. I don't believe so. No. Well, what about uh, Mirza Tahir Ahmed? Did he publish any revelations? I don't think so. Uh, he spoke about a couple of his dreams. I remember that, which which were fulfilled. But not so. like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Not like you. Well, I'm not comparing myself to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed either. I'm just saying I get a few dreams here and there regularly. Some inspiration comes in my heart. And I, as I said, I, I believe that's an ordinary phenomenon. That, that's nothing, that shouldn't be something exceptional. That should be an ordinary part of a Muslim's experience, in my opinion. So how come Mirza Masur Ahmed can't pronounce the Ayin? Can't pronounce the what? The um, Ayin? The Ayin? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess because he's from from the Pakistani background, and, and and it's it's a Semitic language, right? You know, like our language is not a Semitic language. That's what you notice. Somalians they speak Arabic really nice, even though it's not their language. Why? Because Somali is a Semitic language. Like they're they're already part of that language family. We come well, from a different. So, so hold know. on, the the Ain and the Ain is unique to Arabic. No other language. Yeah. Do you make that sound? Right. I was taught Ayn, Ayn as a child. Since I was taught as a child, I can say it now, right? Some people in America and Canada weren't taught as a child. 
So even in their older age, they can't pronounce it properly, right? Yeah, probably that's what it is. If you don't learn it in childhood, then you throughout your life it's a difficult, it's a challenge it's to difficult. pronounce. It. It's gonna be the things I learned in my childhood. I'm like a mechanic. If you got a flat tire, bro, I will do that in a minute. I could swap that out in a minute, right? Literally, you you, you could count. But so was Mirza Masur I'm a taught the Ain and the Ain as a child. Does it show? Well, apparently he wasn't taught properly. I, I agree. His his recitation is not ideal, but but it's all right. I mean, it's not a big deal for me. So okay, what about Mirza Glam Ahmed? How come he couldn't say the Ain? Again, it's, pro it's probably the same reason, right? Because you know, he might have had a, and I, and I don't know where you're going with this, because you you probably know that the Prophet Moses had a tongue uh, issue as well, right? No, we disagree with that. That that's a Kadiani argument. That's not exactly <laughs> true, but we can talk about that on another stream because that's a long, long topic. We're already past the hour. I was only trying to go an hour, but okay. So we'll maybe part two will cover. You could write a list of questions and we'll, and we'll cover that. So, okay. Did Ibn Abbas believe that Isa al Islam would have Mumituka, aka Mutawafika, after his second coming? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, I, I can tell you. We researched it, we've looked it up. Ibn Abbas believed. The verse, chapter 3, verse 55, was out of sequence. Wa does not connotate sequence. He said, uh, hold on, uh, let me pull it up. Because, well, it's, um, I think it's, inni uh, mutawafika wa rafeoka. Yeah. Right? And there's some other wa's probably, right? He says, that's out of order. He said, rafeoka happens first, then mutawafika. And he said Mutawafika right. is going to happen upon his second coming. I mean, we've looked up all the references to Ibn Abbas, right? If, if you go through all the books and you pull everything he said that people recorded, it's clear as day. What? Okay, and you didn't know. Did Mr. Glam Ahmed know? What do you think? I, I don't know. Okay, well, yeah. Mirza Glam Ahmed in his Allah Ham, he did not tell us that uh, uh, Ibn Abbas in Bukhari was not in Bukhari. It's in a chapter heading. A. He didn't tell us that. He didn't present it properly. He didn't say Ibn Abbas believed that he would physically return and then die. And then Mutawafika equals Mumituka. He didn't tell us that. Ever. 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 No Qadianis have ever said this. Well, in any if, you, if, you allow, if you allow me to comment on this. So... Yeah. The, the point, the reason we represent Ibn Abbas's quotation that inni mutawafika wa rafiuka ilayya wa mutahiruka min alladhina kafaru the meaning of, of uh, mutawafika is mumituka we're not presenting Ibn Abbas's belief about Jesus' second coming we're just concentrating or our, our evidences regarding the meaning of the word mutawafika because as you know a lot of the other uh, ulama of the Sunni mainstream they keep insisting, no, 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 mutawafika does not mean mumituka. It means to be taken in full body and soul. So we present Ibn Abbas's quote in that context. No, but the, the Sunni ulama isn't saying mutawafika doesn't mean mumituka. Yeah, most, mean, of them, most, of, most no, of them do say no, no, you, that. Yeah. You, you, Ibn Taymiyyah argued that, for example. No, you misunderstand, okay? What they're arguing is it can mean death only in one two con like two or three contexts right it could mean he died Allah physically lifted him and then revived him and we don't know how and then he's going to physically return still right that's one context that's Imam Malik so that's my next question Imam Malik believed that Isa died at age 33 and was physically lifted after he died after and it's the death of sleep not death it's a different death. You know, um, uh, there's a dua Muslims say every morning when, when we wake up. Uh, Allah, th thanks for waking us from, from uh, mata, right? From moth. But that's not the death of death. That's the death of sleep. 
So right. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed also presented Imam Malik. And I disagree with you. Well, we're focusing on this side of it. No, 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 no. You got to tell us what the story is straight up. You know, so I don't do the competitive dribble. I'm not here to compete with you. I'm not, I'm not here trying to convert people and making it sound and sugarcoating it, right? This is what the story is. You can believe it or not, right? I don't, I, I don't care. I'm not going to misconstrue it to get someone to, uh, uh, to join. Okay, so, so did it, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed present this information academically properly, academically being honest? I would say so, yes, you know, because um, one of his books is called, uh, in Ruhani Khazain, is called Al Haq Dili. And this is a, a written debate he had with uh, one of the students of Nadir Hussein of, of Dili. His name was uh, uh, Bashir Bopali or something like that. Right. Right. And and they had a long debate on the eye of the Quran, Wa in min ahl al kitabi illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawtihi, in which I believe Mirza Ghulam Ahmed very strongly with evidence. He proved that the ayah does not mean that uh, before Jesus' death, you know, like they won't believe in it before until Jesus dies. Rather, it means until they themselves die, and that's the that's actually the the, the stronger view of the classical mufassirin of the of the exegetes of the Quran. And so, I believe he 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 really like he has a book called Izalai Oham as well, and he has thirty verses in the Quran. With explanation, how each of these thirty verses prove that Jesus of Nazareth is deceased. Yeah, and so, so I, I respectfully disagree. I'm sorry. I read all that. Uh, uh, which okay, here's the second part of that. Is Abu Huraira a gubby? Uh, I don't. I wouldn't say that. No, I would never say no. Uh, why did Mirza Glam Ahmed say it? Well, again, I'm taking your word for it that he said that. I mean, uh, these are things I haven't verified. But uh, if he did say that, then I don't, I don't agree with it. Obviously. Okay. Uh, why do I know all these things, but Amdis don't? <laughs> I'll just, I'll just cause, well, cause we, we, we well, because you see, you're, you're, this is your focus of, of, of. Uh, this is your ministry, you could say. If you're a religious figure, this is your, your ministry is refuting Ahmadiyya. And my ministry is not defending Ahmadiyya. Like, I'm more holistic. I have a lot of other stuff that I'm involved in. It's not just, you know, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed every day and night like you. You know, you are Mirza Ghulam Ahmed this and Mirza Ghulam Ahmed that. Well, I'm, I, 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 that's part of I, I have studied him, you know, to some extent. But that's not what I'm all about. I, I, have, I have a lot more to offer is what I'm trying to say. Got it. So, okay, I just posted the... Uh... Uh, Sahih Bukhari on uh, on so I'm I'm gonna read this to you. Uh, Sahih Bukhari, let me pull it up. Uh, Sahih Bukhari, a uh, book on prophets, book 60, Hadith 118, volume 4, book 55, Hadith 657, uh, chapter, the advent of Isa <laughs> bin Maryam, al Islam, narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's messenger said, Rasulullah said. By him in whose hands is my soul, Isa, the son of Mary, will soon descend among you and will judge mankind justly. He will break the cross and kill the pigs, and there will be no jizya. That's taxation taken from non-Muslims. Money will be in abundance so that nobody will, be, will accept it. And a single prostration to Allah in prayer will be better than the whole world and whatever is in it. Abu Hurairah added, if you wish, you can recite the verse. There is none among, there is none of the people of the book Ali Kitab, that must they will believe in him before his death and on the day of judgment. So Abu Huraira says that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talked about the return of Isa, and he says you can say this verse, which is chapter four, verse one fifty nine. So because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed knew this, he said Abu Huraira is a gubby. What does gubby mean? Right, it's not a flattering uh, word, but I think it means stupid or something. Um, but but you know what? Uh, I don't agree with him calling Abu Huraira Ghabi. If he did, I mean, I, I haven't verified that. <laughs> but I just want to say that Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, I respect him. He's a prophet's companion and a very uh, special companion. Uh, he connected this ayah with, with the second coming of Jesus. I don't agree with him because another companion 
who is superior to him in understanding of the Quran, namely Ibn Abbas. Remember, Ibn Abbas is that Sahabi who the Prophet prayed for. Like he's he's considered the Mufassir of the Sahaba. And Ibn Abbas did not connect this ayah with the second coming. Ibn Abbas in, in, uh, said that the Marja Thamir of Motihi is not Isa, it is Ahl al-Kitab. So Ibn Abbas's interpretation is, is, is the one I take, not Abu Huraira's. Okay, uh, have you read uh, Ibn Abbas? So I'm going to say I disagree. Well, what you just said is totally incorrect. Um, uh, um, Ibn Abbas, have you read uh, Ibn Abbas on chapter 4, verse 159? Yeah, I have his, I have his uh, interpretation on my on my website. I've, I have the reference in Tafsir Ibn Jarir. You can check it out. And not just Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Ikrama, um, a couple of other, Adahak, I believe. A couple of these from the Tabi'in as well. They interpreted 4, 159 as not the second coming. The Marja is the mirror of, of Qabla Mautihi is not Isa, it is Ahl al-Kitab. Yeah, so so let me explain that. Uh, on a lot of verses, there's secondary, tertiary views that so you can also have, right? So what they said, and you're misunderstanding it, they said, okay, this verse means before Isa's death. But also, it could also mean, and when, when you say it could also mean, that doesn't negate the first meaning. Right, Muhammad Sallallahu is the last prophet. He's also the best, and you can't say he's the best now and not the last. And I've tried to explain this to Kalyanis because in Tabari, Tabari gives all the views, and then he says this is the most correct one. Right, so they don't contradict each other. You can have it in uh, in second. So uh, I pulled up the tafsir of Ibn Abbas. It's online, brother. It's online. I just pulled it up. I just posted it. Let me, let me drop it in in the YouTube chat. Um, hold on, some something's wrong with, with, with my YouTube comments. Um, Ibn Abbas himself, and and I told you we've I don't know if we've agreed on, on this, but he believed that uh, that Isa would physically return, right? And and I you you want me to read it? Here it goes. There is none. There is not one of the people of the Scripture, the Jews and the Christians, but will believe in him. In Jesus, that he was not a sorcerer, Allah, his son, or his partner, before his death, or after the soul of Jesus expires. That is, after he comes down again and then dies. You see what I'm saying? Um, after every single Jew in their time will be. So what? Here's what Muslims believe: the people on earth, the Jews and the Christians. Will all believe ninety nine percent? Let's go ninety nine percent because there could be people living in caves that that didn't come out. Ninety nine percent. This is the Islamic belief. Believe it or not, you you got your opinion. Cool, but this is what we believe. This is what I current currently believe. Um. So so did Mirza Ghulam Ahmed have the right to call a Sahaba a gubby? And do you still respect Mirza Ghulam Ahmed after this? Well, like I said, I have to verify what he actually actually said that. Um, because there are some of the things which you have put on your blog, which I later checked out, and you kind of have uh, given a false impression. So I have to check it out. It's possible. Like I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. It's impossible. But if it, if he did say that, as I said, I'm not blind following him, and I would say I disagree with him on that. Okay. Wh uh, what have I posted on my blog? That's not exactly true. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> Well, um, for example, just right now, not even on your blog, you remember you were just saying that how Mirza Ghulam was at a train station and his wife was, you know, he was taking his wife without hijab or something. I heard, I heard the her same story before, but it's not the way you put it. What it was, was Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was standing on the platform next to his wife, who was in the burqa and everything. And one of his companions, Abdul Karim of Sialkot, who was very conservative and very, very, you know, traditional in that way, he even said that, you know what, you shouldn't even stand like your wife, tell your wife to come to the to the women's side, you know. Why is she standing next to you? Even though he's their husband and wife, what's wrong with them standing together? So Mirza Ghulam Ahmed told him that I don't believe in that kind of parda. Like I'm not going to go to that extreme of parda where a husband and wife shouldn't even be seen in public together. That's the, the full story of it. But, but the way you give the impression was like, oh, he's going around the train station, you know, with his wife uncovered. That's not how it was. <laughs> you know? Okay, uh, let me read it to you. Um, Mirza Bashir Ahmed says, this was stated to me by Nuruddin that once um, Hazrat was proceeding on a journey 
and, and waiting for the train at, at a railway station, which was to arrive. And uh, um, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed started started walking with BB Saba on the railway station, and and they were watching them walk together. Uh, and Mobi Abdul Karim, who has excessive feelings of honor and religious uh, sentiment, came to me and said, "Many people are watching. Please ask uh, um, um, Hazrat Saab to make BB Saba sit somewhere." Uh, Mobi Nuruddin said, "I can't. I'm not going to tell him. Stop. You know." And she was frolicking. You know, I, I, I don't have the Urdu, but she was frolicking with an older man at this point. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Mobi Abdul Karim himself went to him and said, said, hey, come on, man. Stop walking around with your with your wife in this manner. Um, and then Mirza was like, no, I so that's how I presented it. How did I even present it any other way? You gave the impression that she was like kind of uncovered, like she was not wearing a hijab or anything. But that's not that's not what it what it meant. I like, never. I, I don't. I don't. Even I, I, I read that in Urdu as well. I remember. And the way you, the English translation you read is also pretty accurate. I think where you put the word frolicking, I think you that's something you added to it. Well, but I'm, otherwise, I'm, I'm saying it now. I mean, why, why else would they say he's just walking? Well, that's what I, that's what I'm explaining to you. If you read it in Urdu, you'd understand. What it was was he's walking on the train station, or he's standing on the train station next to his wife. Okay. And that's perfectly no normal. There's no nothing wrong with that in Islam from the Sharia point of view. But Abdul Karim, he was from a Ali Hadith background. He was kind of on the more very, very ultra conservative. He was even saying, you know what? Uh, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look good. You know, you, your 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 wife shouldn't be standing next to you because the, the men are looking at her. But the men are looking at a woman in black, like like in the burqa, the head to toe burqa. So what's wrong with that? Well, so, we don't know if she was wearing a burqa. She, she was, I assure you, she was wearing a burqa. Well, that's not in the story. You see what I mean? That yeah, but you, you, got, you, got, you, see, you got to understand a lot of context, cultural context when you when you present this stuff, right? Like you're, I'm just giving you an example of how you gave a different impression of what something really was, right? Well, well, but that is not, that's your opinion. I posted it exactly how it is. Uh, it doesn't say she was wearing anything on her head. Uh, they just said they were walking. Yeah, but, but it doesn't doesn't say she was not wearing anything. Like so, you're you so you're you're assuming oh she must have been like 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 wearing a a, a dress or a mini skirt or something. No, come on, it wasn't not, like that. No, not the way you're. Not a mini skirt. No, no, no. As you know, a Pakistani women, the, a lot of them go out without dubatta. You were in Pakistan, right? Not all of them are wearing. Yeah, but, but she wasn't. She wasn't one of them. She was not going out without dubatta. She was okay. fully okay, covered. So the, once again, Abdul Karim's objection was not on her clothes. Abdul Karim's objection was that why is she in public view, even in her burqa and everything, because he was that ultra conservative. There are Muslims like that who like a woman shouldn't even be seen in public, even if she's on burqa and everything. They, that's what Abdul Karim was about. And that's what Mirza Ghulam refuted him or explained to him. No, we're, we're not about that kind of part. We're not going to that extreme. Yeah. So feel free to give it that coloring. It says nothing about burqa, what she was wearing. She came from from Delhi. Who knows if they even wore, if she ever even wore a burqa. We don't know what her whole situation was. We know Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. We know she was in her house without a dubatta in front of Nuruddin. And Nuruddin called her Bibi Saba. And Nuruddin, and she, she told Nuruddin that she's her londi. Have you, have you read that one? No, no. See, my, my point is, brother, that I, I just, I'm, I'm not, I, like, pardon me. If I don't just take your word for it, like I want to verify these things myself. Oh well, brother, the blog is there. It's it's the blog is there. You you you're doing a good service by presenting the references, and you do present the references, so somebody can look it up. But I just see like in the in your comments on the articles that you present you present the quote, for example, but you kind of give it a, a an impression that you know it's not exactly the way it is. You know, that's well, my. Well, who, who, okay, whatever. Well, well, um, who has more experience in this Amadia nonsense than me? And, and I'm saying based on everything I know. So I know things you don't know. Like you don't know about the Londi. Um, can you okay, explain yeah. the Londi situation? No, I, and, 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 and you know what? Uh, I, I confess, you, you have a lot more knowledge about the Sira of Mirza Ghulam Mehmed and all that. But I, I just have come across a few of your things which, which make me hesitate to accept it you know, 100% the way you're presenting it. I just want to. Sure. I need that's okay. to know the context. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's okay. So, um, you didn't know about the Londi situation. Um, you didn't know that with with Nuruddin, she. I don't. I don't think there was any further with Nuruddin, Sialkoti, anyone, because she lives with him in the same house. 
in the same mansion, bro. Like you wouldn't, the Dubai is probably not on, you know? Um, uh, and uh, didn't uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed walk around uh, uh, Qadian with 10 plus women at times? Women massaged him. Uh, they said it wasn't even haram for women to touch him and vice versa. Uh, so I'm just putting all that together. So, so I'll just give you a, a very brief answer to some of these things. Like, for example, women massaging him. We're talking about little girls that are not even at puberty. That oh, just that's even worse, out. brother. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. That's even worse. That's even worse. Look, I don't need a massage. Okay, I play basketball, football, whatever. I'm out running around. Right now, I'm out of shape. So it really hurts. I don't get a massage from a human being. I ain't never got a massage, bro. Even I was married for 10 years. Don't need it. As you know, in Pakistan, them lazy old men, chala minu aake latar aake. <laughs> they even tell it, tell it yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing, right? It's, but if we're going to go by the Sharia, like we, your your culture is American culture, obviously. You, you, you don't want, you have your personal space kind of, and I have the same thing. It's our culture. Like when I'm in Pakistan, you know, I don't feel comfortable people just so in my face like that. It's a cultural thing. But if you're going to go by the Sharia, we're talking about little girls, maybe four, five, six years old, just lovingly rubbing his feet or something. It's, oh, no, there's nothing, there's no the problem brother. with that. Brother, I'm, I I feel like calling the police right now. <laughs> I, you're doing what, bro? I, I, if I knew. And the, the 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 other thing you mentioned about the house, like you know, he's he's in the house with him. You know, the houses in 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 those days and even today. You know, we're talking about a complexes, like you know, where people live with their servants, but their servants have their own quarters. So there is still the sparda, but they're in the same kind. Where'd you go, man? Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your questions. No problem. Yeah, so, so so I understand that. but And we sort of went off track. I don't even know where we started and how we got there. But okay. And I think this is my last question. Uh, um, would, do you believe that that Isa al-Islam died in India and is yours also? No, actually, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Like... Uh, like I, I don't I, I I I doubt that you could say I'm skeptical of that. It's possible, but I'm skeptical of that. Okay, have you read the newest research on Yuz Asif? We uncovered that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed lied. In in his book Arazi Hakikat, he quoted the history books of Kashmir and didn't like I told you with Ibn Abbas and Imam Malik, he didn't present the story. In those books it says Yuz Asif was the son of a local king. Mr. Glomhammer left that out. All he had to say was, mm -hmm. hey, it's there. Here's my interpretation. I disagree. Like I've told you, hey, bro, you can believe whatever you want. I disagree. Boom, boom, boom. Like we're talking. Mr. Glomhammer didn't even mention it. You know who found it? Shamsuddin. He found the books Mr. Glomhammer quoted, and it's so clear that he. we know he lied, Okay. Um, see, see, when you say lie, right, you're talking about deliberately misrepresenting the facts. So again, uh, I, how can you be so sure he was deliberately? Maybe, maybe he didn't read the entire book himself. Maybe he just selectively quoted from it. So you could say that he made a mistake. I, I personally believe that Mirza Ghulam made two major mistakes. Number one, this thing about Jesus dying in like I believe Jesus died, but I don't think he died in Kashmir. I think that's far fetched. Number two, he said uh, Arabic is the original language, right? All the languages of the world descend from Arabic. It's the mother of languages. Well, well, let me, I, let me I don't think that either. You know. let, let, let me just stop. I don't think MGA. Oh, he did make that argument in uh, Minan al Rahman, I think. Minan al Rahman, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, these, so, are two, these are so two beliefs which I. I okay. Pardon me? Okay. So, so, in your opinion, those are his two biggest mistakes. What yeah. about his belief in being the second coming of Krishna? Krishna! Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I haven't studied that much about that, and that's not too controversial for me either. Because, because when he's saying Krishna, he doesn't he doesn't mean the Hindu belief that Krishna is 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 God or is a incarnation. He just he just saying that Krishna was some kind of righteous uh, Indian that lived long time ago. Maybe he was a prophet. You know, we also believe prophets came to different nations, so it's possible Krishna was a prophet, and later on Hindus deified him. But I personally uh, um, uh, don't believe any of these Hindu gods were prophets. 
Ram or Krishna or anything like that. They're just, to me, they're all mythological figures. But if Mirza said that I'm Krishna, the, the reason he said that basically was to, uh, was to provoke the Hindus, you know, to, because Hindus have, you know, have this huge image of this uh, blue deity that's playing a flute and, and just kind of re really weird. And Mirza Ghulam was like, no, no, that, that's not Krishna. I'm Krishna. Like, you should respect me more than that. So, and that's why the Hindus hate him. Hindus and Sikhs, they hate Mirza Ghulam Do you know why? Because what Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said about Guru Nanak, that he was a Muslim, the Sikhs got all outraged about that. And then Mirza said, I'm, I'm your Krishna. The Hindus got all outraged about that. And that's why the Hindus and Sikhs, they, they, they don't like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed at all. Like, they hate him. Okay, but, but yeah. in India, MDs are doing great. In Qadiyan, 85% of the city is Hindu and Sikh. And Amdi's never been attacked, right? In 1947, the biggest massacre of Amdi's to date happened in in Qadian, right? Didn't Sikhs kill 27 Amdi's? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your point, though? Like, yeah, they they killed. Well, them. you said they they have a problem with MGA. Not in yeah. India. In India, they love Amdi's, and Amdi's love them. Amdi's have never had any beef. In Qadian or anywhere else with Hindus and Sikhs. Well, well, that that's in our time, right? Because if things have changed, like this is political, right? In his time, the the Hindus were really like the Hindus of Qadian. They they used to hold conferences in Qadian and they used to attack him. And uh, he had that whole issue with Lake Ram. He had that whole conflict with the with the with the Arya Samaj, uh, this very aggressive Hindu sect, and so. Even even after Mirza Ghulam Ahmed died, the the Hindus had a huge problem with the Jamaat because the Jamaat was really strongly, you know, pro Pakistan movement, and uh, and uh, Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmed, the second Khalifa, he was really involved in the in the po politics of that time as well, and he was very anti Hindu kind of politics, like anti nationalist politics, right? Because the, in that time, the, the the some of the Muslims they were on the side of the Hindus. They're like, we, we need to join with the Hindus. The British are our enemy. Let's have a united India. Let's be independent. But the Emily's like, we're having none of that. The Emily's like, no, no, no. We can't trust the Hindus. Just because the Hindus are brown people like us doesn't mean doesn't mean they're better than the, than the white man. At least the white man is a Christian. The white man is from the Ahl al-Kitab. These guys are worshiping cows and pigs and whatnot. So how can we how can we be on their side politically? So that's that was the whole issue back then. I'm talking the, the early, you know, 20th century. So okay, uh, final question, and we'll take some callers. Uh, what about MGA and that opium boy? What about that? As far as I know, uh, he put opium in some of the the medicines that he came up with, uh, some of the medications that he came up with, and so I, I, I'm not an expert in the Sharia and the fiqh, whether that's halal or what is the ruling on that exactly, but. Uh, that was apparently his view that it's, there's no problem with that. So, well, I know, that, I know we have no, alcohol no, no, and medicine. No, no, no. But there's a glam said in 1903 in uh, Dafe al Bala, right? He said, he said, I'm diabetic, and people have told me, why don't you take opium? You know, it'll be good for you. He said, but yeah, as a, as a medication, right, for the diabetes, right? So, but no, this is a legit reason to take opium. He's saying, here's the context. People have told me you should take opium. It's halal for you. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem in Islam. You have diabetic. You can take opium. He, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said no, because I feared people will joke. The first Messiah was a Sharabi, and the second one was a Nafimi. Right? Did he say this? Yeah, yeah, he did say that. Yeah. Okay. So essentially. He's denying to use opium for anything, even for a reason that no one would object to, diabetes. So, so that, like, that shows his taqwa, right? That, that, that's, that's something in his like, favor. I'd rather die than, yeah. than take medicine because it's got opium in it, right? Yeah. So, so are, you, are, you, are you using this against him or in his favor? I don't understand. Well, so, so let me tell you, in his lifetime, he said, and in Punjabi, I can say it better in Punjabi, I will die first. <laughs> right before I, I I take anything with with opium, I'd rather die. Right, I'd rather suffer and die. And I, and I think his dad said the same thing in a Sirat al-Madi. But twenty years later, in Sirat al-Madi, 
Mirza Bashir Ahmed says, oh no, he took it because he was impotent. Zadam Ishk. Oh, and not only that, for the plague, he made uh, Tiriaki Elahi, which was majority opium and didn't work. So they, they contradicted him. So now we know, and if you look at his eyes and his behaviors, he was probably on opium his whole life. And it would have been halal in the Sharia. But he couldn't admit to it because if, if you're on opium for medicine, can you even pray? Your prayers aren't aren't halal. Because what does the Quran say? If you're so messed up, you can't pray. Don't don't approach the prayers. So now what's your opinion on that? Well, again, I think you're exaggerating it when you're talking about he was on opium his entire life to the point that he got intoxicated by it. He got high on it that he couldn't pray. I don't think it was like that. He, used, he might have used it for medicinal pur uh, purposes. He might have uh, prescribed it as a medication. And, he, and and you're right. It may not have been actually a, a legitimate form of medication. But remember, um, even our Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he gave prescriptions to his followers, which were unscientific. And he lay like, for example, the famous story where some of his companions are grafting um, uh, plants on, upon each other for to yield a greater harvest. And the prophet said, why are you guys doing this? Don't do this. So they didn't do it, and then it affected their harvest. Like, it, it damaged their crops. And then they came to the prophet and said, well, you gave us this advice, and, and it had a negative effect. He said, "He said it's my personal opinion. Like, this is you guys know better about these worldly affairs. I'm a prophet. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a medical expert. My medical opinions, my scientific opinions, those are not revelation. Those are my opinions. I could be right. I could be wrong. But when it comes to my religious views, that's a different story. Okay, so I disagree with you with you on that entirely. I disagree with your interpretation of that hadith. But with that, you know, we're here to to not uh, fight each other and et cetera. Uh, with that, let's take some callers. You up for some callers? I got my brother's been waiting there for a minute. Let's see if he joins. Yeah, sure. And sure, then go ahead. let's do a few minutes, see who wants who's who wants to show up. I, I posted this link on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh <laughs> Uh, um, Addy, brother, are you there? Do you want to ask any questions, brother? Yes, slowly. Walaikum salam. Feel free to, to ask the brother anything. Um, so basically, I was listening to you about, you know, the Mirza was standing at the uh, train station. But didn't Mirza Bashiruddin, he wrote in one of his books that, you know, the Ahmad John's trouser was really tight. You know, she used to wear like a legging sort of thing. He said Shalwar is better, but you know, she used to wear pajama. And uh, there was another thing that she used to go to Lahore alone for shopping. Right? Yeah, so this is something I, I know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so these two things. And the other thing is when he's, he spoke about the. Uh, uh, when he was in Pakistan uh, about the, um, what's his name, the uh, ID card. So when you fill the form and everything, if the agent filled the form, you signed it and it says everything on it, right, is fact and truth. And that's why you sign it. Do you understand? So it's not the agent. Do, yeah, do if, I can answer that, that, if I can answer that so part. The, the form was online. It was on the computer. It was computerized, right? I didn't sign it. He took my uh, thumb imprint. He took my fingerprints. He had some kind of scanning device. He took my fingerprints and it just automatically uploads them to the to the form. Then I left and he, he, he must have sent it to the to the agency. And then a couple of weeks later, they approved me. They sent me the card. Yeah, his, his mic is muted, I think. Yeah. All um, right. Okay. So did when Mirza Masroor Ahmed filed for a passport and an ID card, he had to have done that to leave Pakistan, right? What did he signify as, an Amdi or a Muslim? Amdi, I, I, I assume. So he, he also called himself a non-Muslim, right? Uh, I've seen uh, my uh, grandparents' uh, passports, and it also said Amdi. But it didn't say a non-Muslim. Like it says religion, it says Ahmadi. So it, it would either say Ahmadi or Muslim, but it says Ahmadi. 
So as I understand it, like you have to sign a form that says if you're a Muslim, you must sign that you, you consider Mirza Ghulam Mehmet to be a false prophet or something to that effect. So obviously, if, if such a thing was presented to me, I would not sign that. But because that wasn't presented to me, either the agent uh, did it on my behalf without me knowing about it, or that wasn't even a question on the form. I don't know. Allah knows best. You went with the Allah knows best argument. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's... laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, there's another thing I wanted to add. You know, uh, didn't Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said that everything comes out of from, you know, comes out of his mouth. It's all truth because it comes from God. And he made so many mistakes. What do you say about that? I don't, I don't know if he actually said that. I mean, um, I'm assuming that, that you read that somewhere. Um, he, he probably wasn't meaning literally like everything that I'm talking about. Because, you know, he could be saying something like, you know, what time is dinner tonight or something. That's not from Allah, obviously, right? But uh, maybe he's talking about the revelations he gets. Those are from Allah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, well, like Yuzi Asaf, he made a, like, obviously, he made really big mistake. So, uh I'm talking about his books. I'm not talking about the dinner, what time the dinner going to be. But I'm talking about, you know, what he wrote in his books. Do you understand? So uh, whatever he yeah, wrote. Yeah, he, <laughs> well, again, again, I don't blindly follow him. Um, so he might have, he could have made a mistake, you know, because because I don't hold him to the, to, to the standard of, as a prophet. Like, you guys got to understand that. Uh, I'm not like other Amadis who just like, you know, whatever he said, they're just going to defend that. I'm not like that. If he made a mistake, I, I, I'm not stubborn. I'll say, okay, he, like I already mentioned them in the stream, a couple of things that I disagree with him. Overall, like I would say overall, he was a good person. He did a great in service for Islam. So I like the guy. I think he was a reformer. That's my position. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. Right. So another thing I wanted to say, um, so when you say you are mulhid, does that mean God talks to you? How 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 does that work? Mulham, mulham means yeah, I I receive inspirations uh, occasionally, like uh, all of a sudden I get I get uh, a divine inspiration, or I see a vision. Usually when I'm in a state between sleep and wakefulness, this this kind of intermediate state starts. I I see a vision. Like once I saw, uh, once I had a I had a vision of of, of an Israelite prophet. Who was uh, who I who, like? I'm I have a I have a vision. I'm walking on the street one day, and all of a sudden I'm started lifted into the air, start surpassing the clouds, get to a point in heaven, and I see this see these bunch of these prophets. Then I see a specific prophet. He's dressed in white. He's very beautiful. You know, I've described this vision before. So I would say these are kind of uh, spiritual experiences, ilham and kashif and this kind of stuff, and I believe that these are true experiences. And a person who experiences that does not mean he's a prophet. Because this is supposed to be an ordinary experience for a believer. So. Right. So it's basically, it's not a question. It's basically a request. If next time it happens to you, would you ask them about the uh, lottery number so I can buy the lottery so I can hit the jackpot? I'll give you half. Well, I don't think so because, you know, the lottery itself is a haram activity. You know, it's a form of gambling, so I don't think Allah will uh, be too happy with somebody who wants to know the lottery. I mean, we were talking about the opium. I mean, right now in Pakistan with the COVID situation, people are suffering. I mean, little bit of haram like Mirza. I mean, can we do it? Well, I'll tell you something since you mentioned the COVID. One of the ilham I have received is that I will never get COVID. I'm totally protected. Like, I'm not even going to get vaccinated. I haven't got most 90% of Canada has been vaccinated, I believe. I'm one of the few that hasn't even been vaccinated yet because I am so confident by this ilham that I will never get COVID. Allah has, has and this was, this was informed to me back when I was in jail, when we were first learning about in the newspaper on a daily basis, you know, COVID is coming. It came from China, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I had this inspiration. I will never get this COVID. And I was on that flight that evacuated uh, uh, Canadian citizens from Pakistan. It was a jam-packed flight. My uncle got COVID. My grandmother got COVID. A lot of people got it who were on these flights. But I didn't get it. So I think that's a div uh, divine protection I'm under. 
Right, I understand. So no more, no lottery tickets. I mean, but no lottery numbers then for me. That's a bit upsetting. Well, you know, if uh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> but yeah. So, 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 okay. Uh, why did MGA die of cholera then? I don't believe he died of cholera. I think uh, that. That, that's not possible. Okay, what about the newspaper that said he died of cholera? The Vakil. And the MDs will never respond to it. They also praise the Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. The same newspaper. Well, because uh, a newspaper is, is, is where is their source for, for, for the fact that he got cholera? I have, we have the evidence that the, the professional doctors, British doctors, Dr. Sutherland, signed a medical certificate that says his death was caused by dysentery. Or diarrhea. Um, so I've debunked that. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Mid, mid, mid uh, in the middle of that. You know that didn't exist till 1940. The argument you just made, it's not in Sirat al Madi. No Qadianis had ever admitted to it. In Mujaddid al Azam, Dr. Bashar al Thamid, who wasn't even there, he doesn't even say who saw Dr. Sutherland. I'll, I'll give you another evidence then. If you, if you don't, if you don't believe the this uh, Doctor Sutherland's certificate story, the fact of the matter, he died in Lahore. That's in, uh, that's not in dispute. And his his uh, corpse was transported by rail to Qadian. There was a plague at that time in the Punjab. It was a well known fact. You can look it up. You can verify it from independent source that the British officials, the railway officials, they would not allow a coffin carrying a corpse to be transported by rail without a medical certificate that was decisive in declaring that the cause of death was not cholera, specifically. And so if he did die of cholera, even if it was suspected that he died of cholera, let alone if he actually died of cholera, there is no way the British officials would have let that coffin on the train. doesn't matter even if you think he's their agent or whatever. <laughs> they're, they're not going to risk you know, a, an outbreak of cholera. Yeah, so let me debunk that. So, okay, first off, he, he was sent from Lahore to, to Badala in a trash compartment. That's A. You didn't know that. There's only one reference for that, right? Uh, Ahmed Shah Noor Kabuli or something like that. Two, you've proven. All you got to do is pay somebody and they'll get the job done, boss. Right? So all you got to do is pay that dude. Well, I mean, how, how, can, how, can, I, how can I argue with the conspiracy theory? How can I argue with the congela? You can make conspiracies about everything. I mean, but I'm just going through the facts. But you just told us your family gave a lawyer some money and they got you out of jail for blasphemy and got you on a flight without a passport. Without You should not have been able to leave Pakistan. They got you out and you're not even – your family's not even amity really. How'd they get you out? So, brother, listen. If it was Donald Trump's nephew, they would have got him out. If it was someone else's, they would have got him out, Right. If, if it's me, I'm going to die. Ain't nobody coming to help me, brother. Allah might. You know what I mean? But you got some friends with some money. They got the job done. So so, so please, brother. And look, you didn't know that the Dr. Sutherland didn't show up until 1940 in Mujahid al Azam by Pierce, a guy who's not even a witness. Not even a witness. So there's a lot of holes in that story too, brother. So let's just leave it to that. Uh, uh, brother, are you still there? Do you have some more questions? Yeah, so uh, I understand he can't give me the lottery number. So if he has his that experience, what about like hidden hidden treasure somewhere, you know, uh, just full of gold? Can he find the location for me if he has one of these um, experiences? Can you know well, that will help? Well, well, my my brother, I mean, on, on a serious note, like the these experiences are not for that for that reason, right? Like the same kind of thing that the the Mushrikeen used to ask the same thing to the prophet. Oh, you're a prophet. Well, why don't you go to heaven and get us some gold? You're a prophet. Why don't you make this fountain come out? Why don't you make your house made of gold? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It's mentioned in Surat Bani Israel. You can read it. So the the prophet said, in, in or he was directed to say in response in the in the in the in the in the Quran, Subhana Rabbi Hal kuntu Bashran Rasula. I'm just a I'm just a Bashir. I'm just a human being. The, you know, just because I'm a, claiming to be a prophet doesn't mean now I have these superpowers. Or that I can, you know, you know, get gold from the sky and stuff like that. That's not how it works, you know. I don't know what kind of approach you have to religion, but, but it's it's not the it's not the serious approach. It's not the it's not the Islamic approach. Regrettably to say. 
No, I understand. It's just, you know, I can't get it in my head because if, if you are claiming that, I need some sort of, you know, I need to clarify it. I need some sort of evidence. Do you understand what I mean? But when it comes to yeah. profit, it's totally a different thing. You know, I'm not going to even question that. Well, because a profit is higher. Like, I'm, I'm not a profit, right? I'm, I'm not even worth the, the dust that sticks to a prophet's feet. And if, if, if it doesn't come for a prophet, how will it come for me? You're saying, if, if you agree that, you know, a prophet can't get the lottery ticket and stuff like that, then why do you expect me to get the lottery ticket for you? I'm not even, I'm not even worth the dust on the feet of a prophet. You know what I mean? I am. You're not a pin word. Um, you're not a pin worm in the most dis despicable place. Pardon me? Okay, because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had that poem where he says, I'm not even a pinworm in the most dis despicable place. Yeah, that, that, that's his, him expressing his humility and his humbleness, you know. But it's, it's, not, it's not that he's literally a worm, obviously. He's a human being. Okay. What else, brother? You got any more questions? No, I'm really tired. I'm going to get <laughs> some sleep now. I'm going to early start in the morning. But yeah. yeah, sounds good, brother. Thanks for coming, brother. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. I love this. Okay, and uh, we're coming up on two hours. We just passed the two hour mark. Um, anything else, brother? Anything else you want to say, man? <clears throat> well, I'll I'll just I'll give my concluding, you know, just a few remarks, just very briefly. First, I want to thank you for inviting me. I know I've been uh, pressing you. Uh, quite a few days or even weeks, I believe, for this, and you finally obliged. So I, I appreciate that, and I think you're doing good work because I think you're 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 obviously a practicing Muslim. I do have some problem with some of the things you do, but I I, I don't know if this is a place to mention it. But you know, your brother contacted me, Khurram, right? When? 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 He contacted me a couple of weeks ago on WhatsApp. <laughs> Apparently. He he, he read the debate that we had, which I put on my uh, website, the in email interaction. Yeah, it's not a debate. It was, email interaction. Okay, well, discussion, whatever you want to call it. And he uh, was impressed with me, and he said, you know, I'm very impressed with you. And and I said, well, what was, what, why is your brother, you know, what's the story with him? And, and he's saying, well, you know, me and my dad, we have, we have issue with him. He didn't go into too much detail. It's your private family matter. And I respect that. I didn't ask about the private details. But, you know, what I have a problem with you sort of is, you know, whatever the problem you have with your brother and your and your dad and some other members of your family, I don't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem right for you to just publicly air that, you know, because that's your brother at the end of the day that that's your dad at the end of the day. I mean, OK, but but let me just stop you there. You're wrong. I I never said anything about my family until Horam attacked me and made videos about me. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying there. This guy, okay, so he, so he, his life is spiraling out of control. He finally filed for bankruptcy a month ago. It started a year ago. Um, as as all this was bubbling, he 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 started attacking me on Twitter. You follow me? Fact. That's a fact. I I simply said, why are you on Twitter if your life is in spiraling out of control? You're you're about to lose your house. You're going to lose all these things. Why are you on Twitter attacking me? And I've been on Twitter. I've been on social media six, seven years. Why did, why did you come now? Why do, what happened in 2020 that made you come? That's all I said, and then I blocked him. You follow me? Fact. That's a fact. He makes videos saying I'm not a Muslim. He makes, video, makes videos slandering me. So in the, in the family, we squashed it. My cousin died. And I tried to go to my cousin's house to give up source, right? Huram and my dad stopped it. They told my cousin's widow, if Bashir comes here, we're, we're all leaving. Don't let him come here. I So did, did they call me? It's all bad. I'm like, it's cool. I ended up showing up the next morning, and I was able to see my cousin before he passed. I couldn't show up to the funeral. My, my nephew, who's a Sunni, he gets involved, and he's like, bro, why do you guys have a beef with Bashir? It's been going on ever since he quit Ahmadiyya. What's going on, right? They agree to squash it. We squashed it. 
I go to my dad's house, we're, we're good, right? Me and Huram had that court date because he was harassing me on the internet. And I was like, bro, you need to stop. If you don't stop, I'm going to start making videos. I'm going to respond. Don't cry when I respond because I'm going to hit you. I, I'm going to, you know, tell what, what the real story is. I'm not a weasel. Look, if, if, so, if any human being has a problem with me, a personal problem, we can throw the hands, bro. I don't do this, this back and forth stuff. He knows that. And he's scared of me, too. And remember, he, he took me to court in 2018. I saw him in 2018 in public. I hadn't seen him in five years. I walk up to him. Salam alaikum. He won't shake my hand. He takes me to court says and, and tells the judge he's scared for his life. I said, judge, what did I do? I said, Aslam alaikum. The judge threw the case out. You see what I'm saying? He fired me from my job. So he did all these things. He went around the Jamaat, told people I did all these bad things, told the family I did all these bad things. I didn't say a thing. I didn't approach him, nothing. Right? So, 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 wait, so just let me finish. So we we go to court. He won't talk to me. I'm like, bro, you didn't talk to me. I'm like, let's squash it. He goes, nope, I won't squash it. My other cousin gets involved at the courthouse in the parking lot. As we walk out, the uh, Huram agrees to squash it. He'll never mention my name. I'm like, cool. Six hours later, he does a video about me, all about me. He reneges. I go to my dad's house. I'm like, dad, this guy's not going to squash it. You you better talk to him now or I'm going to start making videos. And, and, and my dad's like, no, I'm not going to tell him to do anything. I'm like, well, then there, here we go. I'm going to I'm going to go do a video with AK Shake. I, I'm going to go hit every channel. I'm going to start making YouTube videos. If you look at my videos, you didn't see my face until last year, until like August. So that's not the story, bro. So I'm sorry. Continue. No, that that's it. I just want to thank you for inviting me. I just leave you with this advice. He, he's your older brother. I mean, he, he might have done something wrong, but you got to respect him at the end of the day. He's your blood. He's your blood, right? I mean, oh, it's and, not right. To I do. Bro, what, what are you talking about? If I see him. Well, I'm cause you, you know, it's that, it's that thing you keep, you mentioned like, you know, he was in the car and you saw him kissing a man and you like, you know, oh, kind of saying too. like he's a faggot or something. Like, come on. Like, bro, that's bro. not right. Listen to me, bro. He's got boyfriends. Yeah, this but, it, but, but you, you, you don't say that. You don't talk about that in public. He's, he's oh. your older brother, right? Come on. Bro, you gotta, you gotta... I don't want to repeat the things he said about me. So the, the things he said about me, you will get beat up. You don't say these things. And see, Ruzzy and, and, and other Amdies don't understand this either. You don't say things to people the way you say them and not expect to get punched in the face. You know, especially if you're a weasel. If you're a weasel and a nerd, you've never been in a fight in your life, don't run your mouth. Hey, that's just a general rule. If, if, if you guys didn't know, consider me teaching you. If you're skinny as hell and you can't fight, don't open your mouth. Shut up and sit in the corner. You know, when you're man enough to say, yeah, I'm willing to back it up, I'm willing to, then go. You know, but these weasels, Ruzzy's a weasel. Bro, he never got into a fight in his life. But if you see him on Twitter, he's he acts like, it's like, bro, don't do that, bro. You, you, something's going to happen to you. Knock it off. So I don't talk to people like that uh, unless I'm willing to take it there. You see what I'm saying? So uh, so what else did he say? You, 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 you said he asked you some questions. Uh, what else did he say? That's about it. It was a very brief conversation. I, I, I didn't want to uh, indulge him either because, you know, as I said, I, I don't I don't really interact that much with Emily's either. You know, I just uh, I, I I'm more on the Sunni side. Like I feel more comfortable with you guys. I'm well, I, brother. Respectfully, we don't want you, brother. Sorry to say, <laughs> okay. sorry to say, but the belief that you're talking about. Well, I, 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 I still I still want to thank you, my brother, for inviting me, and inshallah we can have future discussion. Sounds good, brother. I appreciate you know. Uh, er, ever since I've been talking to you, you've had a good attitude. Um, we disagree on, on, on Islam, on many things, but thank you for being brave and coming. You know, that's very brave. You answered all my, you know, whatever we wanted to ask you, you didn't even care. So uh, uh, much respect. I'll see you around. And whenever you're ready to do a part two, let me know, bro. And, and then stick around for the backstage. Okay, inshallah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that, that's all, folks. And peace out.